This is Comic Geek Speak, episode 1755, a cornucopia of comics conversation, 2019. I'm Shane Kelly. I'm Matt. I'm Ian Levenstein. I'm Adam Murdo. And I'm Chris Everly. All right. Hey, guys. Welcome to the show. Hippie, yo, hippie, hi, hi, yay. <laughs> it's a holiday season. Bum, ba, dum. So hoop de doo and dickery duck, and don't forget to hang up your sock. And I have gone completely insane because I'm getting very little sleep. <laughs> and we're coming down there to me now. Oh. oh my God! I was just thinking, Chris. One of the things that I miss about uh, doing this Skype thing via video to save bandwidth is that I don't get to see you doing uh, the Mego doll crawl. Yes. In your geek lair and so forth. Yep. <laughs> Damn good to hear all your voices, brothers. Damn good. Oh yes, it's likewise. Been a coon's age. Yes, I think if it's it, it's been kind of a rocky uh, early holiday season here for all of us, folks. Yeah. Which is one reason why we're coming to you with this usually Thanksgiving themed episode, like two weeks after the actual yeah. Yeah. holiday. It's <laughs> past Thanksgiving. It's past Saint Nicholas Day. It's the second week of December, but we're here. And we're together, and we're going to talk about geeky stuff, and we're going to support one another, and that's what matters the most. That's right. I, I don't know about you, but I'm still full from Thanksgiving, so I think I think it's uh, I think it still mat- matters. Well, it still counts. I, I'm 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 not looking for a pity party, but I'm going to say I never really had Thanksgiving. I think mm. I had a burger for lunch that day, oh, and my man. wife had a chicken wrap. Um, we were at the hospital with my mom, who mm. we. Um, Sorry to say she passed away and we buried her to the, earlier today. Um, but uh, it, it's better. She's peaceful. She's restful. And she's with your dad again. Yeah, she's with that again. And I hope the hell they're dancing and cutting up the rug in some casino while they're getting ready to sit on a beach as well. I don't, they, they love <laughs> going to casinos, beaches, dinners, buffets. The roadrunner is serving them cocktails. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> amen to that, sir. Amen to that. And then, and then unfortunately, my grandmother-in-law also passed away mm. a couple days after my mom so we had one funeral today and the next funeral's tomorrow but it's all good chance especially we're glad you're with us then yeah mm. yep. yeah you are among friends and fun times good good to blow some steam right the distractions are a bonus that's right oh. <laughs> that's right all right we want to talk about first about jealous the bevy of topics we could address okay uh well I, I guess I guess the first thing we can pick we can pick up is uh, is some uh, news that broke a day ago, which was officially c- confirmed today, that uh, Marvel TV is yeah, no more. I saw that. Whoa, 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 whoa! See, I'm I'm so out of it. Elaborate, please, brother. So, uh, pretty much everything that we thought was going to happen with Kevin Feige taking yeah. the reins happened. Uh, Marvel Television is ceasing operations. And merging into Marvel Studios. Yep. Uh, what that means is that uh, Jeff Loeb is uh, essentially out of a job as of January. Yep. Um, he's going to be tra- yep, <laughs> <laughs> helping the transition team over. And any any projects that are currently in production, including those uh, those three animated uh, TV shows for Hulu and Hellstrom. Will be continuing, but anything after uh, anything else that was planned, including you know what might have been that Ghost Rider show that got canned, and uh, and one or two other projects are not moving forward. And uh, and yeah, basically this is this is the end of this chapter for Marvel Television. And we'll Wait, see- I, I'm 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 confused now. So when you say Marvel Television, you mean the stuff that was not going to be Disney Plus? Yes, correct. Yes. Okay, I yes. got you. Anything so- that's in production is going forward anything in development has stopped yes uh and, and that includes uh you know i mean agents of shield the final season will move forward yep. 
uh, Hellstrom will move forward and the three animated series will move forward. But uh, everything else is just going to be under the Marvel Studios banner after this. So we don't know whether that means that there won't be anything else on Hulu to come because, I mean, hell, it's owned by Disney, so it could easily still show up there. Oh, sure. It's just uh, it's whatever Feige wants, Feige gets at this point. Now, when you That's say it. animated, you mean like like the Howard the Duck show they're going to do? And it's correct, well, yes. Yeah, so, and, and stuff that's on Disney+, Plus. that's still moving forward, I would think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I actually think the final season of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is is done. It just hasn't aired until next year. Right. I thought I right. heard at the last Comic-Con they said the final episode of the series. Yep. Yeah, good good point there, Matt. Yeah, I think, they, I think they pre-shot. You're right. I think they shot the two seasons together, and they're all done. They're moving each actors on their own projects, you know, going down the road. But the whole season has yet to come out. Yeah, yeah. I'm so far behind on that show. I don't know if I'll ever catch up. <laughs> the only I'm only behind on the current season that just ended a f- you know few months or weeks ago, whatever it was, and this one that's unaired. I, I did watch up to that point. We'll yeah. See. Hmm. Other other names uh, affected. Uh, I mean, not that I really know who any of these individuals are, but uh, executives that have that are that have, that have essentially been laid off as part of this merger include uh, Court Lane, Marsha Griffin, Mark Ambrose, Tom Lieber, and Amy Carlson, who are all part of the Marvel TV team uh, that uh, that are now looking for for new work elsewhere. So, and so these are the people who oversaw the Netflix shows, for example. Yep, probably Netflix, yeah. Netflix, Hulu, the whole shebang. I think they did a wonderful job. Yeah, and uh, Pearl Mutter officially has no power. <laughs> that guy's still around. Holy mackerel! He's he's corner office, like I've described it before. They they can't get rid of him exactly, but they sure as hell can give him no power. Okay. And that's and that's pretty much what they've done is uh, they they want to they want to streamline things under what works, and obviously you know Marvel Studios is what it what is what brings home the bacon. So I guess we'll see what happens come for, coming coming forward. Do you think in, uh, say, six months, a year, we're going to get rumblings about uh, how Foggy's a backstabber and all this other stuff since he liquidated the uh, the Marvel uh, television division? Or do you think it's, hey, you know, we want everything under under the studio? Those and type of, well, I guess I could still create animosity. but I, th- <laughs> I think it'll be very gently put in that they just wanted to combine it into Marvel Studios and have one general universe going forward kind of thing. Oh yeah, that'll be the Marvel Studios line. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think I, I, I don't don't be shocked if eventually you do he- see Jeff Loeb, you know, come out and, and have some choice words <laughs> considering that this was his baby, but uh I think with everything considered, uh it this just makes sense, you know? <laughs> it makes sense to just consolidate and 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 move forward under under this action. I can see that. All I would say is that, just speaking for the peanut gallery, is that I would hope that eventually they'll return to some of the properties, either in movie or television form, that we saw, for example, on Netflix. Because I thought, with the exception of, of to some degree, Iron Fist, that they were of very high quality. Um, and in some ways, to me, it's more exciting than some of the films. So I hope they return to some of those, like like like. Daredevil. I heard rumors of a Punisher movie, for example. Um, you know, Luke Cage, all of that. So Jessica I Jones, etc. I believe I heard that uh, Kristen Ritter said she would not reprise the role. Um, and I, I know Charlie Cox is part of the. Uh, I think like hashtag Save Daredevil. So it sounds like if they told him tomorrow we're going to shoot episodes that we can't release for another two years because of contract, he would be in. It sounds like uh, some of the other actors in that series were. And I saw in an interview with. In the last month, that um, uh, John, I forget his last name or how to pronounce it, um, played the Punisher, basically said, "Hey, Frank Castle still in my bones. That he's not ready to move on from the character either." John so, Bernthal. John Bernthal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, I mean, I thought he, he made a spectacular Punisher. Oh, I, I concur wholeheartedly. I, Loved it, it. It's amazing if you if you watch the first, you know, that's series after watching some of the clips from his appearance in daredevil season two how much that character gets elevated when you, yep. when you kind of put everything together so uh, I, i'd love to see if he could re- reprise the role in any capacity yeah, yeah. I, I, it would be difficult if you're not gonna do a, an um, or a solid pg-13 type series or movie for him but um I, i'd love to see him come back mm. and charlie Cox. yep i agree with you on both counts there yeah. matt but i'm uh 
wouldn't be too sorry never to see Kristen play Jessica Jones again. <laughs> honestly, I never bought her in that role one bit. Um, I, I look at uh, promos on ABC for Kobe Smulders in Stumptown, and I think to myself, okay, there's Jessica Jones. Why didn't we get that? And maybe at some point in the future we will. Well, uh, I mean, Kobe Smulders, uh, I mean, her Maria Hill has been excellent. Um, yep. Yeah. So uh, if we get someone of her of her stature and uh, and, you know, her pedigree to to play Jessica Jones in in Marvel Studios productions, then I would be a OK with that. Uh, I, I, I enjoyed Kristen Ritter stuff. My problem was the story that they were telling, which mm. never really feel felt very alias to me. You know, mm. never really felt very Jessica Jones. Um, also, a good it started person. off that way. Uh, with uh, with the Purple Man, but then they meandered and deviated a bit too much for my takes. There were some aspects in the third season I liked, but the second season, I, I couldn't wait to get done with it. I just found myself not being interested at all, and I think if it wasn't... The only reason why I got Netflix to stream was for the Marvel shows. If it wasn't a Marvel show, I would have dropped that a long time ago. Um, I, I Actually, there's some things about Iron Fist, I, I, uh, specifically the second season, I thought once he got a little bit more familiar with the role and everything, but uh, I, I, I did kind of, I know people praise Jessica Jones, but I kind of thought that was probably closer to my to the bottom of those series than the more people, other people seem to put it. Yeah, I'm in the minority here. I love Jessica Jones. I mean, I, I agree that the first season was the strongest, um, but I, I dug the whole show. Yeah, I, I love the first season. I can't to be honest, I can't remember if I watched the second season. I know I didn't. I know I didn't. I know I didn't get past to the third season because of how far behind I am on everything else. But I didn't even know there was a third season. Yeah, I, I know it came <laughs> out. It was canceled before that aired, I believe. It was, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I never finished the second season. <laughs> I'm I'm about halfway through the second season. I'll I'll watch it eventually, but it's it lost me, and it's very hard to get me back to to you know to to watching something when I'm only half interested. Um, but I, I still need to watch that last season of Daredevil, which I know is excellent. Oh, oh, yeah, I don't. Oh, I didn't see yeah. that either. I know I, wa- I know I watched the second season of Daredevil, yeah. but not the third one yet. I, I would say that's a series that was solid from season one to season three, mm-hmm. to the very end. Um, just yeah, so, Mr. Levinstein, you have an assignment, sir. Ho. Oh, no. <laughs> Uh, and the, I don't, I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I have a bunch to catch up on. I still haven't watched season two of Punisher. Yeah. I, so much TV, so little time, but I, I will definitely get to Daredevil and I will let you guys know what I think when I get there. Well, and, and it's funny you mentioned that about so little time. So when we talk about, you know, the crisis as part of this program, I look forward to discussing my return to the DC shows. I haven't not watched any of them for three years. Oh, wow. Wow! Wow! So I, 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 I mean, I'm looking forward to expressing my opinion. <laughs> well, uh, before before we before we get there, I actually just wanted to touch on a, a trailer real quick uh, that came out. We're going to be talk, talking a lot of trailers on this episode, but uh, it is it is uh, DC TV related. Uh, the trailer was released for the upcoming Star Girl series. Oh, yeah. oh, I didn't see that one. Yeah, I did see that. Yep, me too. Yeah, I, I got a little bit too excited when the the. First thing you hear, and spoilers because we're going to talk about it. The first thing you hear is Starman. Starman. I'm like, what, what, what? <laughs> <laughs> and then it was the classic Starman, which is fine, but oh, I was kind of hoping. It was actually the classic, like, Star Spangled Kid. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, you know, as an adult, as Skyman, as he was from oh, yeah, Infinity yeah. Inc. But then uh, they, they renamed him Starman. I was kind of hoping it was Jack, but that's all right. Yeah, well, yeah. that it's way. Still, it's still good. We, I'm sure that sooner or later somebody will adapt I Jack hope Knight so. and Opal City and all of that yeah. in, in some fashion to another medium, probably I a, a streaming series or something. I love the way her costume looks. I love the the cosmic rod. looks fantastic. I, yep. It looks really good. Yeah, the lady that they cast, um, I, I don't remember her name, but it's it's alliterative. Yeah. Like it was, Breck Basinger. Br- Brent Basinger, did you say? Breck. Breck. B-R-E-C. Oh, okay, that's... That explains it. Okay. Yeah. Now, is this taking place within all in the context of all the other DC shows? We're not sure yeah, yet. Um, however, it's going to be airing on DC Universe, and then the next day airing on CW. So I'm going to assume that it's just, that it's going to be 
you know, involved with the CW shows. In some fashion. And, yeah, we're not sure what the context of those shows is going to be yeah, after the post-crisis. Yeah, right, right. It, it could very well be one universe. Yep. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. But I love that uh, Joel McHale is playing this, uh, playing the Starman character. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And I like and um, Luke Wilson. Luke Wilson being in it. That's kind of cool. He gets to be yeah. stripesy. Yep. <laughs> now, I, there's, there's a, but now, I have the DC app, and there's a bunch of people um, that I read or see on Facebook or whatnot or, that are kind of up in arms about it airing on DC Universe app first and then going not, a, like you said, a day later to CW. Mm-hmm. I don't care about that. I yeah. mean... I got the DC app for Young Justice first and foremost. Right. And Teen Titans. And Teen Titans I like and I don't. There's things I love about it and things I'm not too keen on. This is the live action one, right? Yeah. But I love all the stuff that does air on it. I didn't watch Swamp Thing yet, but I like all the um, archive stuff that's on it. I'm not happy that they cycle through and change every now and then. I'd rather have everything up all the time. But every now and then, like, things will come on, things will come off, things will come on, things will come off. Mm. And that's fine. That's just the way they choose it. But then they added the comic book aspect of it, and they keep adding more and more digital stuff, which is great. So for me, it's still worth it. I enjoy it. I don't read as many comics yet on it because I'm still getting through my backlog of what I ordered Uh paper-wise. But as that dwindles and I just continue, for the most part, probably with just Justice League and some special issues here and there that come out. Um, I'll read more and more on the app as long as they keep putting it out on the app. And then whatever shows come on and whatever archive shows are there, I'll watch them. So I'm okay because even though I do have a DVR and I do record stuff, it's still kind of a pain. I'd still Mm -hmm. rather watch it on a streaming thing. And when I watch it, if I miss an episode or something goes wrong and I watch it on CW's app, they still throw commercials in, which is fine. Oh, I just, I just waited through that. <laughs> at least I can watch it. But I don't mind that Stargirl's going to be on the DC app and then on CW. I just won't watch it on the CW. That's all there is to it. I have the right. app. So I'm, I'm fine with it, but there's a lot of people that are kind of up in arms about it. I'm not upset, uh, especially since uh, my my main way of watching it is via the app, just because I don't really get very good CW signal mm-hmm. here in the Bronx. Um, so if even my over-air antenna, I might try to get a better one at some point, but it doesn't actually really get Channel 11 WPIX here. Um, okay. So I would have to watch it on the CW streaming app, and I... You know, on the bright side, they put stuff up, you know, at midnight, which yeah. is nice yeah. because I was able, I was able to watch Crisis almost immediately after it aired, right. which which was good. But, uh, you know, whether I have the DC Universe app, which I'm already paying for, or the CW app, it's potato potato for me. Like, I don't yeah. really care either way. Yep. And, and I think it was the second episode of Crisis that kind of fizzled out on my DVR. So then I just went to the CW app and watched it there. Hmm. So, I, I, I again, like Ian, I could still watch it. Yeah, I don't. I don't care. <laughs> I'm just happy they're making yep. it. Just wait an extra day. There's yeah, no, no harm in that. And it's it's a sign of the changing times that broadcast TV is now taking a back seat to yeah. all these streaming services. Yeah. But well, yeah, I mean, I think it's inevitable. I don't know how long that. I mean, broadcast TV will not that I don't think it's going to vanish, but come on. I mean, it's all about convenience. If you can yeah. watch a show whenever you want without having to deal with. A gazillion big pharmaceutical commercials, um, which is basically all they play now because, you know, <laughs> uh, I won't get into the politics, but I, I'd much prefer to, to watch these shows streaming without all that nonsense. Yeah. Sure. You know, so I, I don't watch any of the uh, the DC TV shows, uh, um, which is something I want to touch on a little bit later when we get into it. But, but I, you know, for the last several months, I knew this was coming up. But I was like, okay, that sounds cool. So I started hearing about the cameos uh, that were coming coming in there is like yes this is what i'm gonna see i'm, I'm cool i can't wait to, to watch this and then the couple of days before i was like i really don't need to watch this live i i stream i can watch cw on demand no problem and then i start on youtube shortly after the episode aired they had clips and i start watching the clips and I, i'm not saying that i could do a, a better job and i'm sure there's people who would try. i thought a couple of the scenes I saw looked kind of cheesy and it was low budget and maybe that's because the only TV series I've been watching I would say for the last couple of years I've watched is Mandalorian and I know that's a 15 million dollar budget on there 
it just seemed, I was like, do I really want to waste time watching this? And then I realized there's only a couple cameos I'm really interested in. And I could just go to YouTube and just watch those specific clips, which is ultimately what I wound up doing. But, uh, but, but you're right. I mean, you don't have to watch it live. You don't have to watch it on demand. You could just go to YouTube shortly after the episode airs. You don't have to wait hours for the on demand. And you could just watch specific clips and all the majority of the good times. <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 I watched a few of those YouTube clips too, but uh, I, I'm invested enough where, where I went ahead and watched the whole damn thing. But, but I'm sure that there are tons of people who did exactly what you just did, Matt, and just, you know, watch the key scenes when they were put up there afterwards. It's like, you know how you could how you don't have to watch uh, Saturday Night Live when it airs live anymore. You can just wait for them to put it all up the next day on YouTube and watch whatever uh, you yeah. know sketches yeah. Yeah. You are, are getting the hot buzz. So, yep. So how about that crisis? <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 I have a question because I guess we're doing spoilers uh, again. I haven't watched anything up until this year. If I if I put all the clips I've watched together, probably of all, all the shows. I've probably seen about a half hour total of the whole Arrowverse. <laughs> um, one of the things that, that I was watching was whenever John Wesley's uh, ship would come in, because I liked his flash and what they did with him. <clears throat> I was reading an article today that I don't know how long it's been, but they've been leading up that Barry was going to die in Christ. And the article was basically how he, the writer felt that we, whoever we is, was cheated because it kind of did a loop. My question is, I... As soon as I heard about Crisis, I figured Flash was going to die and was going to John Wesley uh, Ship's version of it, not the one that has the TV series. Was that a surprise? Which one actually well, it, got it, sacrificed? It, it was because the article that they kept flashing up through all these years in Flash was always a picture of Barry saying the Flash has disappeared, written by um, Iris. And that's fine. And when this started kind of last year and into this year with the monitor saying, well, a flash must die, this is written, blah, 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 that's all well and good. But then there are things that have happened in those first couple episodes that the monitor didn't count on or that changed. So for me to see the 90s flash sacrifice himself to save Barry makes perfect sense because the, even the monitor himself can't reliably call everything that's happening because there are things changing beyond what he foresaw. So I expected that to happen now, just given the way this first half of the season went. Like, they're so focused on Barry preparing everybody for him disappearing, him disappearing, but I know his show's not ending. Mm -hmm. I just assumed it would be another Flash, and it made sense to be... Mm the John Wesley ship flash. Uh, they, they did surprise me, Shane. Yeah? I, I did not see the, the John Wesley ship twist coming. Um, I, I expected that Barry would, in fact, vanish, but uh, vanish doesn't necessarily mean perish. Right, right. And I thought he'd just kind of bounce around the speed force for a bit. There'd be several weeks' worth of shows where the rest of Team Flash has to defend Central City without him, and then he somehow finds his way back to Iris, as he always does. Well, I kind of thought that, but they've done that so many times. I kind of thought that might be too easy. And, but but really, I, I mean, it was always just in the back of my head this season that it would be John Wesley Ship in some fashion, whether it's Jay Garrick version or Barry Allen version. I wasn't sure which way they would go. But as soon as they show the cosmic treadmill and just the first note of his theme song from the night, I'm like, oh, well, that's what's going to happen. So <laughs> I didn't 100% know until that second that you first see him, but... It made sense. And in, like, again, like I said, in the back of my head, I thought one of the versions of his character was going to die, not him, just because of what the Monitor couldn't accurately predict as time has gone on. I think that uh, all of this is a red herring and Barry's still going to die. Oh. I think that's totally a possibility. Yeah. Uh, just just because if you if you foretell something for this long, and you don't connect in at least one way or another. And, you know, yes, they could have him come back, you know, Flash Rebirth style or or something along those lines, you know, even an episode or two after the fact. But they're going to have to kill Barry Allen. I, I, I am 100 percent sold on that. And I mean, the Barry Allen. It's just it, prophecies like this, especially one that you set up in season one. If you don't connect 
that's a cop out. But, and I, I'm going to be disappointed if, if we don't actually get that in one way or another. I, I thought that it was a very touching scene with John Wesley Shipp and, and bringing in the, the footage from the, his actual, yeah, you know, first episode, show, yeah. the first episode was a beautiful touch. Yeah. Um, but I still think our bow, our bow is, our bow is going to bite it. I, I still think there's a possibility they won't do that just because of how the story's going. But I think, it, like you said, I think it's entirely possible they will. Yeah. But if they don't, it wouldn't surprise me. But if they do, it, like, it won't surprise me no matter what they do. <laughs> and if they don't do it, I'm perfectly happy with the way they did it. And I'm okay being fooled all these years because instead of the crisis happening X amount of years in the future, it's happening right now. Well, that's one change. Mm -hmm. And the fact that the monitors messed up a couple things, that's another change. And the fact that certain other characters aren't going to be where they're supposed to be, that, you know, there are things that are, that are fluid about this that I didn't think there would. I thought it would be more following what the Monitor had told about. And, and that's changing, and he can't explain why, necessarily. Yeah. And I, I did have a question here. Now, it's been a long time since I read Crisis. But the is there die. a point where... <laughs> people get to the um the was it the the point of uh the, the merging point or whatever it was at the very uh, the end the where everyone yeah the vanishing point the yeah, that, that's a concept that wasn't introduced uh, to the dc mythology no. until safely after crisis yeah well so, okay well good it, when i when i saw that uh, again i'm just watching some clips and i saw it and i was thinking that's that's kind of like what they did with the recent secret wars when they remolded everything how that ship was kind of not in that specific point mm. but it was and then I was like, I, I know people are going to say that Secret Wars has kind of pulled a lot from from Crisis, but did that come from uh, an original idea in Secret Wars, or was that kind of really from Crisis that 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 where it, where it came from? So we're kind of a copy of a copy of um, kind of like Viper was with Knight Rider, and then the Knight Rider reboot. But um, so I was kind of curious about that because, like I said, it's been so long since I read Crisis, I, I couldn't remember if that was an aspect of it. No, that that's a bit of post-crisis lore that found its way into the the, the Arrowverse, and that they decided to use in you know, the Arrowverse's version of Crisis. All right. Well, Murd, I've been dying to ask you because you are you are the strongest critic of all of us when it comes to just the art of criticism, and as a crisisologist of the first order, one of the world's leading authorities on this story. <laughs> what uh? So, what's your general take on what you saw? Well, you flatter me, Chris. Uh, Just the truth, brother. It's it, it's a fairly positive take, Chris. It really is. Um, yeah, Peter and I, you know, my, my fellow crisisologist you know, and, and a resident uh, CTS expert in uh, all things uh, Wolfman Parisian. Um, we uh, and we, we agreed. We, we recorded our latest crisis tapes just a couple of days ago. Um, everybody out there listening will be able to hear that uh, shortly after you hear this. And uh, we did spend a little bit of time talking about the first episode of Crisis oh, because at that point that's all the, the two of us had seen. Uh, but we agreed that it, uh, it it did justice to the crisis concept. Uh, it, it it had that uh, apocalyptic feel to it. I mean, it, it's we're certainly not going to evaluate it on how well it evo it slavishly adapts the original series because it's just it, it, it's not and it can't it's not going to do that and it can't do that it, it doesn't have the budget for one thing and for another it's afflicting a very different version of a dc multiverse i mean this is it it's a very good equivalent of the crisis story for the multiverse the television arrowverse in which it's taking place um i, I it's it, it's adapt it, it it took that that, that vast crisis scope that um, you know, it evoked and uh, recounted 50 years' worth of DC Comics continuity and sort of collapsed and truncated it down to cover you know, uh, the past, uh, what is it, nearly 10 years of Arrowverse continuity, and plus uh, little nods to other, other media DC projects along the line. Um, if anything, it, most of the criticisms I'd level at it are sins of omission, which means you know things that uh, other cool cameos that I wish they'd crammed in there. But and I know Mark Guggenheim, uh, who was uh, one of the showrunners for all of this, uh, agrees with me here. They they had a list of, uh, I think he said this in one of the Kevin Smith hosted aftermath specials. They had like a list of a hundred cool things they wanted to do, and they had to collapse that down to fifty cool things that they could do. But that's still doing fifty cool things, yeah. which is you know something to be proud of. Yeah. Um, so all those neat cameos, all those little alternate 
alternate Earths that we got to see that were familiar to us, and we didn't really realize that they were alternate Earths until the antimatter wave came and washed them away. I thought the Birds of Prey cameo was oh, especially neat. Yeah. That's another nod to yeah, good one. WB slash CW network sure. history with the DC character. Yeah. The I redheaded loved, stepchild. I loved Robert Wool's little cameo. <laughs> oh, that was fantastic. Robert Wool loved it too. Yeah. Well, well the the thing though is, is that he's he's uh, the, the newspaper says that uh, that Batman took on the Joker and uh-huh. didn't didn't the Joker die in that um, in that first movie or maybe 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 they found a way to get to, to come to come back or there was another Joker or who cares because it was a cameo. Right. Yeah. I'm going with who cares it was a cameo. <laughs> <laughs> or what the hell? All three. <laughs> exactly. I, I have. A, what did you? So the, two of the ca- those were uh, the Birds of Prey was one I really wanted, uh, and then the Kevin Conroy oh. and the Tom Welling. So I, what? Um, let's start with Kevin Conroy. What did you guys think of that version of Batman that, well, that they gave us? That was that was one of my favorite moments of all three episodes, and I'll talk more about my general feelings later. But first of all, they had him quoting The Dark Knight Returns. Yeah. Literally, like verbatim, when he's talking about when he's, he he killed Superman, they took they lifted dialogue right from the book, and to hear Kevin Conroy say that dialogue in person, yeah, like, it was was live really on thr- screen, yeah, right? It was really thrilling getting to play Bruce um, Wayne on camera. Yeah, yeah, it was for me that was a my favorite, you know, guest star moment of of, of the, the crossover thus far, and also I thought one of the strongest points of all three episodes. That that uh, I. Go ahead, Shane. That one surprised me. I really didn't think they would take it in that direction. I thought we would just get a happy-go-lucky Bruce who's just beaten his body to a pulp, and that's not what we got. And I loved it. I thought it was brilliant. Yeah, me too. I thought, yeah, it was a bait and switch, and I thought, but I was expecting Terry McGinnis. So yeah, was I. It's, it's, yeah, it's I Earth was ninety-nine, yep, as I in was nineteen ninety-nine when that came on the air. Yep. And also Bad of the Future, all that yep. stuff. But yep. no, it turns out it was just a little chase your tail time suck thing. Where, yeah, uh, yeah okay, uh, Kate Kane, go to Earth-99 and fight your cranky, crusty, mass murderer. Alternate. Uh, alternate cousin, cousin Bruce. Yeah. Just to come back again to discover, oh, you were the Bad of the Future all along. Yeah. yeah that's, that, I mean, it, that part, universes that part. are dying in the meanwhile, but we have to send her off on this little journey of self-discovery. As no, much, you didn't. Just tell her. As much as I like the cameo, that part did bother me that she just came back and, well, we, you're really the, the paragon anyway. Oh. <laughs> um, exactly. But yeah, I, I expect the Terry McGinnis to pop up somewhere, and I'm like, oh, wait, he's just evil. Yeah. But it was still cool. I'm sure they could have gotten Will Friedle to play him, oh, too, God, on camera. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Not Will Friedle. I would have been perfectly okay had they gotten David Mazous to play Terry McGinnis because, uh, no. you know, like to at least have him have a Gotham reference in one way or another, you know, because I would have loved for one of the one of the Earths to be, you know, Gotham Earth being. Uh, I was right. expecting that. At yeah, some point Shane and too. I were looking at each other like, who's David Mazous yeah. just now? So yeah. he, he was he the kid played Bruce Wayne on, on Gotham? Just, Yes, he is the, he is the the kid who wound up being you know eighteen by the time the show was over. Okay, uh, <laughs> playing, playing Bruce Wayne, and frankly, that's why I, I think he would have fit perfectly as Terry uh, in in the crossover. It, I, I didn't quite like the version. I, I was I knew they would never do this, but I was actually hoping it would be more that I'm assuming that when all this is over, they're just going to have one. That isn't Supergirl actually take place on its own Earth beforehand, but. I, I'm under the impression that at the end of this, everything's going to be on the same singular earth and that he would essentially be just popping in occasionally like John Wesley ship, I, I guess did on the flash and just kind of give guidance. And, and I know that would be kind of a stink from the stuff that I've heard about what they're doing with that woman. But that, that but at this point he was just broken down and, and through all the fights and stuff like that. But he wound up being a lot more of a darker character than what I cared to see. Um, so I, I was watching I was like, oh, you know, all this big talk is we're finally going to see Kevin Conroy act the part and not just give his voice. And then I kind of thought, this is the version that, that you gave us. Um, well, I, I didn't I, I think, care for it too much. I think for Kevin Conroy, it gave him a chance to play Batman in a different way, Bruce Wayne in a different mm-hmm. way. So as much as... It, as much as the writers might have enjoyed writing it that way and giving us a bait and switch, I think he also might have gotten enjoyment out of doing it differently and being somewhat the bad guy, whereas he's always just the steadfast mm-hmm. Bruce Wayne Batman, truth, justice, mm-hmm. which is fine. I love that. But I think it was a neat little few-minute twist. And I always like stories where they show the cost 
of that kind of life or trying to maintain that kind of dedication and, and, and what it's wrought essentially on him. And I loved when the case of, of, you know, trophies yeah. of, yeah. you assume he killed all of them, right? All these, oh, yeah. Yeah. That's at, right. including that. Clark. Yeah. <laughs> Love so, the tone in uh, Kara's voice when she calls them trophies. Yeah. 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 Um, <clears throat> I mean, and switching gears a little bit to the Tom Welling cameo. Oh, yeah. I loved it. Um, this was exactly how I wanted that to go. Uh, just because I knew Tom Welling never wanted to be in the suit because he said it over and over again. He said it over and over again in the days of Smallville. He never wanted to be in the suit. So I, I know it would have been, you know, satisfaction for all those people because I, one of my favorite things, uh, there, there used to be this, uh, uh, comic I used to follow like a comic strip where uh, the, the day of the Smallville finale airs and, 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 you know, the, the character angrily slams the door behind him and like, uh, like, and he's asked, so, so, so how was the Smallville finale? He said, good, but that's not the point. And, 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 and that's, and that's saying that, you know, we never even got to see him in the damn suit, but I knew that they were going to cock tease us again. I just had a feeling like we're getting Tom Willing back, but guess what? You don't get to see him as Superman. You get to see him as Clark Kent because that's all he ever was on Smallville was Clark Kent. You know, he was not supposed to be Superman. You know, I saw a lot of social media stuff basically saying that I wasted 10 years on Smallville and you never get to see. I, I felt the same way that you weren't going to see him in a suit. And in a way, I thought we got a Kingdom Come Superman, right? You got the regular Superman. It, why couldn't one, one of the alternate Earths essentially be whatever happened to the man of tomorrow, where he basically is just living a normal life? Yeah. And I thought, to me, that was one of the, the, uh, the clips that I watched, one of the best ones that I saw. In yeah. fact, I think my favorite line is when he's talking with Lex saying, uh, I sure don't miss these two cats. <laughs> I was uh, thinking the same kind thing. Kind of just being dismissive to Lex. Um, well, but I, I love that was brilliant. I, sorry, I, I'm ahead. glad that's what they did. Uh, that, was, I was just going to say, I was glad that's what they did with that version. Which I think that's the only way they were going to get Tom to come back anyway. And what I liked about his performance was that it's almost like he was almost amused <laughs> and, and like amusingly exasperated by dealing with this version of Lex Luthor and just he had his facial acting was great. Mm-hmm. And I was like, are we, are you kidding me with this? Like that was basically what, what his face was saying. And, <laughs> um, it was, it was, it was really well done. And I, again, because I haven't watched the DC shows in years, I hadn't seen John Cryer as Lex Luthor. I really enjoyed his interpretation. I did um, too. It's kind of like a real, like, you know, like a kind of more of a silver age, you know, rubbing my hands together to try to plot the demise of, of my enemies type of thing. It was, it was it was amusing. He came back specifically for Crisis because originally he was only going to be Lex Luthor for the three episodes from last season, but but when he caught wind that they were doing Crisis on Infinite Earths, and he himself is a is a big comic fan, he, he collects like, Kirby artwork. Chris, really? Yeah. Oh, well, I didn't he know has that. the money to do so. <laughs> True. And, Bless him. And 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 he still feels bad about Superman Four. Like he said that in many many interviews. Like he, he wishes that he you know, could have actually been in a good movie, but it's just not the way that the cards were rolled. Yeah. You know, they didn't yeah. have money to make the damn thing, so they couldn't make it good, and that's half the reason he took the role of uh, Lex in the first place, and he's back now because it, he heard it was going to be crisis, and he's like, okay, I'm in. I'm in. What are we doing? I'm in. <laughs> well, I, I really enjoyed his interpretation. One thing, if, if I may just throw in a few quick, because I'm like the guy on the outside now because I haven't watched any of these shows in years. Um, so a lot of this was new. I, I am completely not sold on that guy as Superman, who's who's in the Supergirl universe. Uh, like Tyler Hudlin is his name. He totally takes me out of the character. Um, that's just me. I like I, I I was actually taken aback at how negatively I responded to his interpretation of Superman. Can I say? I'm sorry. I let you go. I agree. And one of the things that's the clip of Smallville. I thought one of their best moves was not to put him too close to Tom Welling because Tom Welling is like this big guy. Like he could be Superman. And I looked at Tyler and I was like, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you have abs and you're in good shape. You just look like a, a small Superman. Even when he stand up to uh, next to Brand, I thought he, he just looked like, you know, Superman's younger brother that was still trying to grow. Well, yeah. And for me, it's not just and again, because I, I really hadn't seen him before as the character. So I was just I was just kind of experiencing for the first time i saw maybe some once or twice supergirl years ago but i kind of forgot but um it's not just the physical stature there's just 
there's something about the way he was playing the character that I'm like, this is just not Superman. And when Brandon Routh came out, I'm like, oh, he's really good at Superman. Like, it reminded me of how much, even though that movie, you know, it didn't go anywhere because of all that, whatever went on with that 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 production. But mm-hmm. I always liked him as Superman and seeing him in, in the Kingdom Come outfit. Like, I, I really, that, that, I really, that really affected me. Like, oh, he's, he's so good. Like, when he's, when he's Clark Kent, he's the editor in chief. And it just, it just, there's the contrast, kind of what Matt was saying, too, really struck me. It just, that, that, the, the newer guy just does not work for me at all. Well, there's well some, that's the takeaway for me. And I agree. The newer version, I didn't mind when he first appeared in the Supergirl episodes, you know, years ago. And he was fine. But then you put him next to Tom Whaling, you put him next to Brandon Rowe, and you're like, oh, just like you said. It just doesn't quite look right. Mm. It doesn't look grand enough. Uh, bearing in mind that uh, this is a Superman coming from a world where Superman is a secondary figure to, oh, sure. to true. his cousin. Yeah. yeah, yeah, true. And let's focus on the fact that uh, up until this crisis on, on Infinite Earths, he's been on a red sun Yeah, in, in, uh, in the Supergirl universe. Yeah. So well, even I've been sick. That away. <laughs> yes, and the, I'm glad you brought that up, Ian, because I, I wouldn't have known that. So... Um, but it just that just one of the things that that struck me. Um, I didn't think the woman playing Lois really appeared like Lois. Like, I, I watched that Tom Welling clip a couple times. Like, so this is Lois because I think they're getting a spinoff series. They are. All right, they are. Yeah, to probably cast for her physical resemblance to Margot Kidder. Yeah, and I liked mm. her in the last crossover more than this one so far. She's also, if I remember correctly, Tyler Holcomb's wife in real life. Oh, really? Oh, oh. <laughs> well, that's that's <laughs> that, that, that. Say no more. <laughs> so yeah, that's uh, that'll be interesting to see that spin-off series. Then, yeah. See what their yeah. how, how their chemistry translates. Yep. But I, uh, I I really enjoyed them in their earlier appearances. I will admit they've been a little underutilized in this crossover so far. But yeah, considering that they're side characters when Supergirl is the main, uh, that doesn't surprise me that much at all. What did we think? Because <clears throat> again, I'm coming at it. You know, having read Crisis a couple times, although Murd, you know, between the wonderful episodes you and Peter have been doing and watching this, I got to sit down and read Crisis again. It's been too long. Mm-hmm. Oh, I definitely encourage you, Chris. Yes, I will. But um, what did we think of how? Because what I one of the things I did like, because I, I have mixed feelings about what I watched. And I'll get into that as we move along. But I thought in the first episode. Now, granted, I have the, the advantage that I know the Crisis story, but even so. I didn't feel like he needed to watch all the other DC shows to kind of appreciate what they were doing in this first episode. Did you guys think it was a good setup? Um, I mean, <clears throat> from 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 what we got, I, yes, uh, I think it was a good setup. And I will agree that uh, if you're coming in cold, you could probably watch this and understand enough of what's going on. Um, especially like even the Oliver stuff. Like I haven't watched Arrow in at least two seasons. Um, I'm still, you know, I have not watched this last season, you know, before now and, uh, and have not watched any of this. And yet I, I was able to put two and two together pretty, pretty easily. Like, yeah. okay, you know, there's, there's Mia, his, his daughter who I later found out it's from the future. So that's a thing. Um, <laughs> that you know. explains it. It's not just a case of Soros. It's uh, she's from <laughs> that. That's why she's so old. She's from the future. Yes, yeah. she is. She is from the future. Uh, she's, uh, Supposed to be uh, his and uh, and uh, what, what's her face Felicity. his uh, daughter. Uh, I can't think of her name. Felicity. Now, all of a sudden, the one, the one, uh, Felicity. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, that that's 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 what she is. Uh, they they were doing flash forwards with her. I know for the last two seasons. Yep. Um, so I guess somehow she must have wound up in the past, like every other, you know, kid it does eventually on these shows. <laughs> um, but uh, no, overall, I felt like it, it was actually pretty easy to get in, you know, and understand what's going on. And I think that even with a cursory knowledge of Christ on Infinite Earths, or if you have none, they're still crafting a very interesting story here. And it's not just and it's not just a whole bunch of cameos, you know, like even with the cameos I wasn't expecting, like Lucifer thrown in there. That was it just, huh. I had, that I had was, forgot I heard that that was coming and. Then it yeah. came up, and I saw it. I'm like, "Oh, I forgot that's that's brilliant." <laughs> Earth six six six. Yeah, nice. And, and and there was a there was a sneaky ad for Watchmen inserted uh, in that in the uh, the shot of L A. 
on Earth 666, you can see in the corner there's a there's a billboard advertising. Oh, I missed that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, but uh, no, it just uh, overall, it just it. I, I'm liking what I got so far. It's it's got enough crisis to keep me rolling. It's even got a little bit of zero hour thrown in there at times. Mm. And, yeah, the vanishing point thing is yes. one example of that. Yep, well, definitely. And, and for me, with 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 anything, I mean, I, I did the same thing with Gotham. I, I still haven't finished that last season of Gotham. It, I enjoy it for seeing all these characters I never thought I'd see a live action version of come to be on a show and i take it for what it's worth it's not my gotham it's not anywhere close to what i think the history should be but it's got good production value and i like who they've been able to pull on and show you i i go to the same thing with this Arrowverse. it's not crisis like i would think but for what they set up over the last few years they're doing a great job telling a story that's crisis like in their universe, given who their big mainstay heroes are, and I'm enjoying it. I don't take it or think that it would ever be even close to the crisis we grew up with or talked about endlessly for years now, but it's crafting a good, fun story, and these cameos are just fun. I don't think too much of it. I don't look for hidden agendas Mm -hmm. or, or anything grand to come out after it. I'm just enjoying it. Right. And you don't need to. It's, it's, yeah, it's just, just quick, popcorn disposable fun. fun. Yeah, it's yeah. just, uh, oh, there, there's a cool thing from DC's past, and now there's the antimatter, and it's gone. Yeah. yeah. And and, and uh, the story that they're telling, I mean, they're hitting what I would consider the important beats of Crisis, even though things have been changed. Like, sure. you know, like, you know, like, like why was Big Turn? You know, like, that that's a very important yeah. part of Crisis that, yep. they, that they worked in one way or another. And you we know, were all waiting for it. Yes, exactly. But uh, the average viewer... Had no idea it was coming. Yeah, because you know they they have no idea what crisis is to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> and I concur with Shane in that the spirit of this because like Shane, said, there's no way they could possibly adapt the, the actual comic book version, especially in this format. But oh. the 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 spirit of it is very much there, and that's what I really enjoyed throughout. One thing I have to say, because again, I've been out of touch with the DC shows in so long, and this really struck me, especially in the first episode, and and maybe this is just me because I've been away from it for so long, I found the dialogue very stilted mm. and flat, especially mm. in that first episode. Yep. And it felt to me like some of the actors are thinking to themselves, I can't believe I have to say lines like this. <laughs> um, and that, that took me a bit out of some of that. The second episode I enjoyed significantly more. The first episode, I, I was struggling to get through it a little bit because I, I was enjoying the spectacle and the ca- love the cameos. I mean, it's Burt Ward, for God's sake, and all of that. And Ace but, the Bat Hound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but but I, I thought the dialogue was – oof. Hmm. It, well, I mean, are all, the, are all the DC shows written like that now? Because if they are, I will not be returning to them. But yeah, um, there, There's some, that, some of that to the law. In fairness, uh, some of the dialogue from the original Crisis comic was kind of stiff also. Mm. I mean, it just – Functional and uh, just uh, characters reacting. Function, perhaps functional is a good word, Murd. That's a very good word to <laughs> apply here. You know, Chris, I was actually I was texting Kevin about the same thing because we were just talking a little bit about it, and that, that's one of the things that I was watching a couple of clips. Is actually when um, Oliver had his last stand and they came back and it was like dying. And he's like, ah, I was saving you, Barry. It, yeah, whatever. That, I was just like, uh, yeah, really that didn't cheesy. work for me. Yeah, and uh, I, I was texting Kevin. I was, it's like. Is this is why I'm not going to watch all the episodes? I'm just going to watch the clips I'm interested in. Was like Smallville like this, or is it just like the quality of the acting and the writing just not as as good as what you know? Say, let's just look at Small Smallville was, even though there was a couple seasons that that dragged and, and you know had its own issues. But I didn't think the, the acting ever seemed seemed as stiff or as cheesy. Um, the dialogue and stuff like that, as the little, some of the aspects uh, of, of of this series, and and again, I mean, I don't know if that's how everything is, or that's just kind of how this mini series is is coming about. Uh, it, it, it it's, I feel like it is a little a little bit more hammed up in the mini series than it is in the individual shows, uh, but then again, also uh, taking in the fact that each show has their own individual writers and their own indi- individual casts and what have you. And a tone, of course. And so. tone, and yeah, and they're trying to combine all the different tones into one cohesive unit here. 
um, there's bound to be a little bit of a disconnect. And I, I do agree that by episode two, things were a little bit smoother. Um, I, I just feel like it just, it took an episode or so for them to get their legs going and for them to be a little bit less hammy. Well, Ian, I think, I think you hit the nail on the head because like I said, I had the same reaction where I watched episode two and I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm more, inv- I'm more invested in this, not just because they're doing crisis and I'm just really loving that, but like the whole, whole, the whole production, I was enjoying it just more. Yeah. Um, and, and you make a good, you make a valid point that. Because I, I watched the first season of Flash, loved it. Watched the first two seasons of Arrow, loved that. I watched the first season of Supergirl, I loved that. And then I just fell off. But all those shows all had individual voices, and I enjoyed all of them. They were all distinct, and they all worked. So, like you said, and it's a fair point. It's not easy to have that all coalesce smoothly. Um, so, yeah. But it, it was that first episode was a bit of a struggle for me, and from that from that perspective, but. As, as, as it went on, I, I was getting more and more into it. And and uh, I want to bring up uh, real quick before I forget to, uh, Murd, uh, something you would appreciate is that even with these uh, episodes that are airing, there's a quote-unquote crisis tie-in episode. Uh, yes, like, actually. Uh, Peter and I mentioned this on our tapes episode, too. We're talking about Black Lightning, right? Yes, I am, yep. yep it's a special crisis crossover. <laughs> Because it's it's not officially a part of the crisis uh, narrative. It's not a numbered part, but it ties in very closely with the events of crisis. The red skies and the lightning are there, and the yep. whole plot of the episode, which is entitled Earth Crisis, is about um, alternate reality versions of uh, Jennifer Pierce uh, interacting with one another and uh, exchanging notes on the different paths their lives have taken. And the whole thing ends with... Uh, Jefferson Pierce being borrowed to participate in the third part of Crisis and his Earth being eradicated behind him. <laughs> yeah, no, that, it, it, was a, it was a nice touch. I, I, I'm not even close to up to date on Black Lightning, but I had to watch that episode just for the tie-in. Mm, same here. Quick quick question. Is this, the, is this the first time we've seen the Spectre? Yes, in the TV shows, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep, and and I, I like that it looks like what they're doing to Ollie, what they did to Hal in the yeah. comics. yep. <laughs> yeah. So now we've got nods to Zero Hour and Day of Vengeance. And and I like little things like um elongated man coming in and saying Holy, Holy All-Star, All-Star Squadron. <laughs> I mean, I know it's corny, but I like it. I'm sorry. I'm I, just glad that Ralph is there. Oh god, he's yeah. one of the best things about the Arrowverse and these I days. I love oh. that he's searching for Sue. For, I mean, I don't know why it's taking him so long to find her, but he's searching for her. <laughs> because it's Arrowverse pacing. Yeah. It's... I mean, I, I, did, I did also like the line, uh, you know, it's not his fault, it's his first crossover. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and and is, uh, all is these... Brandon Ralph done with playing the Adam? Uh, he's almost yeah. done. Yeah. They're, they're going to, he he and um, uh, his, his real life wife are going to depart um, Legends after this is all over. Mm. And they've because introduced they, Ryan Choi now. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw that that aspect. I was like, well, I think he's the Adam as well. Um, so that's why I was wondering if Brandon is, is moving on, yeah. or if he's going to be uh, Kingdom Come Superman, who's going to make appearances on occasion. But, no. yeah, this this was the best way to go out for him uh, as as a farewell, both to uh, you know the Adam character, even though he'll still have an episode or two in, in Legends before he's gone, mm-hmm. but to be able to. Play Superman again, and to essentially have a coda on that character, you know, since he never got that second movie and yeah. he never got to, you know, really get his, his his feet wet as the character was just so awesome, and essentially to tie together Kingdom Come Superman with Christopher Reeve Superman, yeah, with, they had the music, uh, yep. Uh, yep, great touch, loved it, mm-hmm. yep. Even through all these shows, all these years, I mean, I've I've liked Arrow, but there's parts of it that I, are just a chore to get through at times. So I'm I'm kind of ready for that show to end. And I know that um, Mia is getting a spinoff. The, the the actress who plays Mia with they're calling it something in the Birds of Prey. And I think it's uh, Green Arrow and the Canaries. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Green Green Arrow and the Canaries. So she'll be back as another spinoff in. In um, as well as this Superman and Lois one, but yeah. as much as I I am disappointed in some of the villains they've used as the main villains in the Flash show over the years, that's still my favorite. I still like everything else about that show and all the ancillary characters and ancillary storylines that go through that. Um, that's that's the one show that I that I really watch 
every single week and keep up with. The other ones I might miss an episode or two and then catch up on it, but but Flash I watch consistently. Mm. I, I still think it's the brightest, the funnest, the one that you can watch with your kids, you can enjoy as an adult. I I just enjoy that one more than the others, just a little bit. I also think that, because I'm, again, returning to this, I think Grant Gustin, as an actor, just delivers his lines better yeah. than some of the other... Like when when I when he's when he's acting, I'm like, oh, he's the Flash. Like like, but he's he does it in a way that's very natural. Like I'm like some of the other characters, I, I was I was cringing a bit. Like oof, but every time he 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 he, he commanded the the scene, I, I was really into it because he just gets that character and and he just he has such a natural delivery that you that you believe him as Barry Allen. It's really well done. And and I like that Cisco essentially got his. Uh... You know what, what? 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 You could maybe even call his Doctor Light transformation, and swear, you know, the mm. monitor just go ahead, goes ahead and puts his hands out, and then all of a sudden he's he's back to being, uh, uh, yeah. you know, vibe. <laughs> even though he lost his powers uh, in a, in a previous season, so it's uh, a, a nice little touch there. It's like, no, we need vibe. Like, no, we don't want to be vibe. Tough shit, you're vibe. <laughs> <laughs> got to do now, what you got to uh, do. Uh, another question. Forgive me because I've, I've been out of it. Killer Fro- that was Killer Frost, correct? Yes. Yeah, but she has a split personality with Kate as well. Uh, is the same actress? That's why oh, I was yeah. confused. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, she she's uh, she's in a quote unquote understanding with uh, with with Kate, and uh, they they share that they share the same body, and and she's gotcha. try, uh, trying to be good, not bad. Now, and so. and this is the first season that that Frost has taken the the center seat, mm-hmm. so to speak, with with being good and being on the show as frost consistently and and kate's kind of in the back seat for right now previous seasons it was always kate and they would call in killer frost when they needed help gotcha. but they could they kind of are giving frost a, a chance to spread her wings for a while and was that dove doing crowd control of hawk and dove um was this in the first episode yeah on on yeah. supergirl's earth uh no that's you're not the first person to ask me that today, yeah actually. no yeah no but that not. was dove but no that's that's actually a character called dreamer yeah she was introduced okay. in uh season four of supergirl um okay yeah which was very heavily uh slanted towards the issue of um well, uh, immigration in the United States today using uh, alien beings extraterrestrials on earth as a gotcha. very thin metaphor for the uh, current uh, uh, American southern border issue. Um, So she's called Dreamer, and she is an alien from the planet Naltor. She's a distant ancestor of Dream Girl of the Legion of Superheroes. And uh, she's also a trans woman. And uh, she has precognitive powers and also martial arts abilities. And uh, so she's just a supporting cast member of Supergirl who was present. And that's one of the neat little touches in that episode that I wish there'd been more of, honestly. As I said before, most of my criticisms of this so far would have been things that, well, sins of omission, things that I wish they'd been able to throw in. Other support, not only different alternate realities, parallel Earths representing other DC diegeses from entertainment properties past, <laughs> but also just uh, supporting cast members, heroes and villains from throughout the Arrowverse as it exists. Um, you know, bringing in like Gorilla Grodd or something from Flash or other other Supergirl supporting aliens. Um, but they did manage to work Dreamer in there, and that was not bad. I, Murd, I want to ask you, what because I was so impressed, what is your take on the, the Monitor's costume? I have loved it from the first teaser image I yeah, saw of it yeah. well over a year ago. LaMonica Garrett really inhabits that. Kudos to him wow. and the costume designer for bringing Perez's uh, visual vision to life. I think I figured out what bothers me about that costume. I think he's he's acting the part brilliantly, but all, something always looked off, and I think it's his eyes. Because oh, the because monitor's eyes are white. Just solid black. Yeah, and and this is this is regular. Uh, I mean, it sounds silly, but it's regular. So something's always looked a little bit off, and I think that's what it is. Hmm. Yeah. A couple of corrective lenses might have. Yeah, yeah, but but, no, but he, that's just nitpicky for what I'm used to. He wouldn't have been able to express himself no, quite as no. well on camera if, no, if they'd not done at all. that, though. So. He does. He does uh, look a bit more like the uh, the Grant Morrison version of the Monitor uh, than the original in that aspect. Well, and that could be. Yeah, that that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and and Murd, I have uh, I have one more question for you. It's not quite uh, crisis related, though. Oh. I think he means he has three more questions for me. <laughs> If, if only this damn thing would play the music. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I do indeed have three questions. <laughs> Uno, dos, tres. Ask me the questions, bridge keeper. I am not afraid. Uno, dos, tres. Ein, zwei, drei. Oh, boy. Well, this, uh, this is a question sent in by Mr. Patrick Finnegan. I want to see that as festive as possible. Patrick Finnegan. Begin again. Yes. <laughs> and uh, he says, hi, CGS crew. I'm an avid listener of the show for several years now, and I thought I'd take a shot at Muddle the Murd. And before I continue, Murd, what is Muddle the Murd? Uh, well, Ian, Muddle the Murd is our <laughs> semi-regular trivia segment here on Comic Geek Speak. Um, in Muddle the Murd, uh, you, the listeners, are encouraged to uh, send in uh, a submission of three comics trivia questions, uh, one about Marvel Comics, one about DC, and one about some third publisher. Uh, the questions must also break down chronologically to one question about comics pre-1970, one about comics between 1970 and 2000 AD inclusive, so it can be a comic from 1970 or from 2000, and uh, one question about comics from after the year 2000. Um, so send in three comics trivia questions meeting those criteria and uh, if I fail to answer any of them correctly uh, you will have muddled the murd and you will qualify to receive a prize and what is that prize today um well it's uh, been uh, traveling around with me in my car for some time now it's I should probably bring it inside and just leave it here in the studio but yeah, probably. Uh, but it, it's still going to be an original art page uh, from uh, Godzilla the half century war uh, by James Stokoe right very good all righty well here here's more of what Patrick has to say I'll admit up front that I'm not well read prior to the early 90s but I wanted to make sure I pulled a question from uh, an issue that I've already read. I don't think Murd is going to have much trouble here, but you never know. Mm. Here goes. And we start off with Marvel pre-1970. In the Incredible Hulk King Size special, we see the first appearance of Maximus's so-called Legion of Evil Inhumans. What is the name of the Inhuman with tree-like powers? Uh, oh, oh, Timberius. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> all right. <laughs> and as, as a bonus, uh, can you name all six of the evil and humans? I'm almost sure I can't. Um, is there a Leonis in there? Uh, there is. All right. He's the lion guy. Oh, uh, who else? Uh, uh, the, the names that are coming to me, I think, are actually of Maelstrom's minions, not Maximus's. <laughs> like I'm remembering an Aereo... Uh, uh. Are you correct? Okay. Uh, is there a Gronk? Incredible. There is not a Gronk. Okay. Uh, Ario. Uh, boy. Mm, the Stallior? Stallior is indeed correct. Okay. He's the horse guy. Uh, <laughs> oh, jeez. Uh, mm. uh, yeah, I'm just going to quit while I'm behind. All right. <laughs> it's, it's Ario Falcona, Leonis, Macus, or Macus. Nebulo and Stallior. There we go, Nebulo. That's yeah. I, I was picturing Nebulo. He has golden skin, but yeah, I wasn't coming up with the name. All right. Well, you have not been muddled, but let us continue. Uh, DC, 1970 to 1999. During John Byrne's run on Wonder Woman, Diana moves to Gateway City. What is the name of the GCPD? Didn't realize they also share the, share the GCBD moniker mm, there. Yeah, good uh, point. O- officer who became infatuated with Diana and plays a supporting role during the run. I believe his name was Officer Mike Shore. You are correct. <laughs> That's S C H O R R. You sure are correct. Uh, that's great. <laughs> and one more for you independent post 2000. In Jonathan Hickman and Nick Dragota's East of West, the four horsemen of Apocalypse seek to fulfill a prophecy by following the message. At one point, the message is literally eaten by a character in the series. What is the name of that character? (laughs) Well, I look forward to reading that scene when I uh, get around to... (laughs) That that sounds pretty loopy, Um, but uh, I I don't even have a guess. I'm just going to get into victory formation and spike the ball here. (laughs) All right, the answer is Ezra Orion. Okay, Mm, cool name. All right. Well, 
thank you very much uh, for uh, playing along with us here, uh, Patrick. Um, I, 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 you were right. I didn't have that much trouble with it, but uh, I'm, I'm glad that uh, you, you submitted that, and uh, I hope you'll continue to be a, an avid listener of the show in the future. I'll try it again. Oh, yes, by all means. <laughs> And uh, it, my my actual my actual crisis related question, by the way, was: Do you think by the time the the TV series is all said and done with this crossover, that we'll actually have one combined Earth, or are we still going to have a multiverse? I'm pretty sure there are going to be consequences of some kind. Um, I'm not going to rule out um, a multiverse of some kind springing back into being because I don't think the writers of these shows, especially The Flash, are going to be willing to give up such a ready source of uh, story ideas and just such a fun toy box with which to play. Um, But um, it was revealed in one of those Crisis Aftermath shows uh, by the showrunner of uh, uh, Legends of Tomorrow uh, that uh, the rest of their – I mean this – the conclusion to Crisis is going to be the beginning of their new season, and the rest of that season is going to be there exploring the repercussions okay. of the end of Crisis. So something is yeah. going to change. Yeah. Whether the, the multiverse is going to die completely or just be restructured, it's a little too soon to tell. But uh, it's, it, it does seem fairly likely that they're going to follow the pattern established by the comic book Crisis mm-hmm. and just uh, dump everybody on one Earth, you know, super, from Supergirl to Black Lightning and right on through. Um, yeah, but uh, so far I'm I, I'm pretty uh, tightly enthralled. I, I like what we've seen so far. Um, uh, the, there were a couple of complaints I had wanted to lodge, fairly minor ones. One was I didn't like the design for the shadow demons. So mm. There's another spoiler. There's there are there is a shadow demon fight, and we will see more of them. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, a month from now when this fi- thing finally concludes, uh, it looked to me like they got a little bit lazy. And uh, just recycled some like software for like CGI designs that they had <laughs> for for uh, ghostly bad guys that have appeared other times. I mean, shadow demons aren't supposed to look like uh, like Speed Force wraiths or like uh, Phantom Zoners from Supergirl or like Dementors from Harry Potter for that matter. Yeah. <laughs> They're supposed huh. to look like living humanoid blobs of shadow that can destroy stuff. And yeah. uh, these guys just kind of looked like generic ghosts wearing like raggedy robes and stuff. That, I thought that was disappointing. Thing. And um, also, you know, funny hearing you guys talking about how you thought the issue, uh, issue, yeah, <laughs> Epis, the second part was better than the first. I actually was more into the first one simply because it felt to me more like the like the the, 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 the pacing and the the, the 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 dire stakes of crisis. It's just like universes were dying, uh, the skies were turning red, uh, hurried, desperate plans were being drawn up on the fly by characters yeah. thrown together in a room, exchanging stiff, corny dialogue with one another. And then we get to the second chapter, and we get this whole paragon hunt thing. And that just felt like filler to me. Like, it was just, just a, a plot device designed to waste time. You know, the, I mean, Guggenheim admitted in one of those Aftermath specials that they needed a MacGuffin hunt. They needed to have the characters hunt for something. Yeah. And they borrowed this idea. So in fairness to them, they, 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 it has some providence in DC Comics. They borrowed this idea apparently from the last uh, Wolfman Perez, JLA, J, I mean, not a Wolfman Perez, Conway Perez, uh, JLA, JSA crossover before Crisis hit, which involved uh, the, the two teams hunting for certain individuals uh, who were key to the survival of superheroes. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but the, the, this whole pseudo-mystical prophecy thing of these seven magic beings that can supposedly destroy the Anti-Monitor. It just seemed like a waste of time. Uh, they didn't need to go that route. They could have just shown more of the characters trying to save lives and just, even like soap opera angst of the, the characters just dwelling on the enormity of all these untold quintillions of intelligent beings and in all these universes dying. And instead, they just had people running around looking for these people. I mean, it did give us that cool sequence on Earth ninety nine, sure, which, you know, sure. which was frustrating for other reasons, as we've already yeah. covered. Yeah. Um, but it gave us Kevin Conroy on screen as Batman. Oh. So, and and that's the stuff I appreciate. But I agree, I like the first episode more for not only the cameos, the multitude of Earths we saw. Like you said, it just felt more of an emergency, an immediate threat that that everyone's confused and trying to figure out and do something grand together mm-hmm. to solve it. So and they managed I, I, to evacuate yeah. like a billion souls yeah, from yeah. Earth 38. Yep. Plus the sacrifice of Oliver Queen, which yeah. I must admit I wasn't really expecting, but it was kind of neat in a way to see that in this version of a multiverse, this is the character that dies instead yeah. of the two yeah. that we most expect to die in a crisis well, story, Flash and, you know, and Supergirl. Part of me still is is wondering if 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 Supergirl, being what she is through all this, 
is still a, a red herring of some kind where she will die, her show will end for at least a while, and this new Superman Lois show will come about as a result of that, or just, I, I don't know, it's just something I wonder, because it's never been mentioned that Kara could die, that she may be the one that sacrifices herself point, to save Shane, everything. Point. Hmm. Just like in the comic, and totally throws everybody off. Hmm. Not that I've read or seen anything, but <laughs> anything can happen in a crisis yeah. Well, yeah. if she appears in Olivia Newton John headband then <laughs> oh man <laughs> if she comes back and sings yeah. Xanadu Supergirl dun, oh. dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Supergirl now I'm she ready. is dead <laughs> now she is dead <laughs> <laughs> I could go on, but I won't. I wish I uh, please do. <laughs> oh my God! Do you mind if I pivot to the Black Widow trailer? Uh no, by all means. Pivot. I think the time has come, Chris. Pivot. Go ahead. Pivot. Uh, oh, Shane, Shaney. Pivot. Please. All right, that that trailer got me so so Jones and for Black Widow. I cannot wait to see this film. The... And David Harbor in an actual Red Guardian yeah. outfit. Yeah. It still fits. <laughs> <laughs> I, I gotta admit this is one of the phase four movies i'm really looking forward to oh yeah but the teaser and i know it was just a teaser didn't get me as excited as i was hoping and i think like i like the the jason Bourne type fighting between the two black widows initially uh but by the time you got to the red guardian and the uh the, you know it still fits you got fat um <laughs> which, which by the way i was thinking wouldn't it how well would that have been received if it was a male character who said that to a female character? Um, but it, but mm-hmm. that, that kind of humor in there is just kind of like, and I'm, it's kind of taken me out. There's some cool things that I saw, and it made me realize more and more how much I, re- I really like Black Widow in the uh, the little bits that when, when she was supporting, especially Winter Soldier. Um, but but that, nothing really moved me. They're like. Oh, I, I cannot wait for this. Um, like, I, uh, like I was hoping the teaser would. Now hopefully, the trailer does more. Yeah, the the trailer the trailer has me much more interested in the movie than than I was before the trailer hit. Just because I'm still disappointed this is all happening after Black Widow is dead. Uh, yeah, that's that's my thought too. Yeah, um, and I. You know, for all for all I know, I'm going to watch this movie, and then in the in the, in the end credit scene, we're going to find out that she's still alive, and that was a scroll who died on on Voromir. Uh, huh? Uh, See, because that you never would be awesome. <laughs> I, I, I have this this ongoing theory about this because this is supposed to take place um, civil war uh, right after, after civil war. After civil war. Yep. Yeah. Um, my theory is this is the start of a Black Widow trilogy it's just not the natasha romanoff black widow trilogy mm. i think it's going to be kind of a, a retrospective movie where you get some of her origins some of the things that they talk about like budapest maybe even with the winter soldier where she took that round uh, um and then you'll get this this adventure in between civil war and infinity war but ultimately you find at the end this might just be yelena um you know reminiscing about that last adventure that they had Knowing that now she has the like getting something, it, it uh, indicating that she is now the Black Widow moving forward in the MCU. So the the sequel will actually and moving forward will just be Yelena as the Black Widow. Hmm. Oh yeah, absolutely possible. Plausible. Yeah. But I'm, I, I'm I'm very excited for the film because a I I, I think Scarlett Johansson has done such a magnificent job capturing the essence of that character, and we've all talked about many times, you know how much we wanted her to have a solo film. Mm-hmm. Um, like, like Shane, I wish they would have done it earlier, but mm-hmm. even so, and I saw her interviewed on Colbert and she made a great point. She said, you know, she said, I'm, I'm kind of glad we're doing the, I'm paraphrasing, we're doing this movie now because I, I've taken this character and this arc. And, um, she's like, you know, she basically was saying, you know, well, well I'm sure it would have been good if we'd done it earlier. I kind of like that. And we're doing it this way now because of the way I, the, the relationship I had now have with the character. Sure. So, yeah. I can see that. Yeah. Plus uh, David Har, I love David Harbor, and I can't wait to see how he interprets Red Guardian. Yeah. So, I, um, I was watching somebody on YouTube that I usually watch. They'll do like, like um, East End. Uh, it was it was kind of neat to see. Like I guess there's a, a map of in the opening apartment of uh, Budapest in there that 
they're actually fighting in little things that are marked. There's a, uh, the scene where uh, Red Guardian is fighting against Taskmaster. You can see a broken shield on the ground that has a T to it. Um, and there's some other neat things that, that, you know, I've watched multiple times that I could never pick up. But I'm still leaning towards, I think it's misleading who the Taskmaster is. I, I, uh, I, I think they're going to hint that it's a guy, but I really think it's, it's, a char- it's a female. Because so far we have not heard who's playing Taskmaster. Hmm. Yeah, I could, I could see that. I could see that. I, I just wish the mask was better because we've oh, had yeah. we've had two iterations of Taskmaster in recent memory in video games that have looked better than than this particular Taskmaster who looks like it's getting ready for paintball. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, the Taskmaster, I mean, the costume isn't that complicated. So yeah, it's, it's not like you have to give him the Buccaneer boots or anything. But okay. I mean, it's it's a skull mask and a cowl, so you know. Uh, maybe they're concerned they've already done crossbones and they don't want to repeat themselves. Yeah. 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 But no, I, I definitely agree with what's being said here. I, I'm not a fan of the uh, Taskmaster design for the movie. Um, I, I think uh, Brack on the forums used it. Well, he, he mentioned paintball too, Ian, and he also uh, brought up like a dirt bike uniform. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I do appreciate the William Hurts back. Uh, I'm, I'm sure he won't be in a lot of the movie, but it's nice to see him in at least a little bit. Well, I like the time period they've chosen because, you know, we know that after Civil War, Natasha was in, in a very sort of nebulous spot because while she sided with Tony, ultimately she helped Steve uh, escape. Yeah. Yep. So it'd be great to see, you know, at that point where, where she goes with all of it. So I'm really looking forward to this film. Can I say, and I think we talked about this with Endgame, maybe in Infinity War. I've seen so many people say how she was underutilized that, that she was just kind of there but if I, I thought she had and i'm not you know she, she definitely had should have a solo movie which i'm glad she, if you watch her character just on its own through the end through all the movies she's appeared i think she has a pretty solid uh story arc that you could follow oh absolutely to warrant a solo yeah, I movie so. and, and civil war is a great example where how pivotal of a role she played with the two sides because she did actually have some type of connection with both Tony and Steve. And it, it wasn't like she was just there. On, like I felt some of the other characters were just there. Like you knew Rhodey was just always going to be by, by Tony's side. And, and Black Widow was just one of those that you were almost kind of waiting. Would she pivot type of thing? Almost like with Spider-Man in the, uh, in the comic book version. So, yeah. Well, of the, of the, female superheroes who had trailers come out in the last week or so. I am way more jonesed for Wonder Woman 84 because oh my god. <laughs> talk about talk about the the perfect uh crafting of setting and at the same time like the music and and the atmosphere and the Wonder Woman outfit itself and uh, just everything was working for me in that in that trailer. I I, I cannot wait mm. to get. I, I agree. Yep. In uh, the in the months since uh, the title of the Wonder Woman sequel was announced, and we knew that it was going to be an '80s period piece, I've been asking myself, okay, why are we fixating on 1984 again? But having seen the trailer and how well that they are evoking that era and its values and its yeah. you know its stylistic aesthetic, uh, I'm with you, Ian. I'm no longer really caring why it's in 1984 I'm because just happy it it, is. it's a great looking <laughs> 1984. Yeah. I, yeah. I the the older I get, I'm going to sound like a like a like a very old man. I absolutely love the '80s. I listen to '80s music constantly. I I just cannot stop. I love it. Everything about it: the silliness, the goofiness, the 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 strange clothes, the teased up hair. I just absolutely loved growing up in the '80s. And every single chance I get to relive it, revisit it, I'll take. I I love yeah. it. Yeah, I found myself watching that over and over, but mostly because I like the, the the variation of the Blue Monday song. And then I found out you can actually just download the Blue Monday song by whoever did it for, for the trailer. So oh. I'm just listening to that nice. over and over. It was Blue uh, Monday by New Order. Uh, um, good question. I think I think I think so. Let me let me let me see. That's what I'm trying to look it up. Did anyone pick up on the outfit that Diana was yes, wearing? Yes. Oh yeah, no, definitely. The Linda Carter 
uh, trademark outfit in, in the series. Yep. <laughs> so, I have not so seen that enough that episodes. Nice of... and hopefully she can make a surprise cameo. Really? No. I've, oh, wow. I've seen maybe two complete episodes of uh, television Wonder Woman. Oh, get out. Oh, wow. I, uh, I got into, I, I would say trouble, but, it, you know, when it airs, people are posting on, on YouTube and, and, like, you know, um, how, does, how does Steve come back? back and, and like is it Hades or something like that and I just based on the trailer because I, I don't know anything else I, I know that uh, Pedro Pascal is playing uh, Maxwell Lord and I just read the theory that I think he gets some type of a monkey's paw power and he's giving people what they most desire but it costs people so like hmm. uh, Barbara Ann it ultimately results in her going from like a nerdy woman to attractive but then she becomes uh, a cheetah. I said for Wonder Woman it's going to be steve's coming back is my uh is my theory and somebody responded well, why do you think I, I pulled it exactly from the trailer the information we have i don't think i spoiled it for anyone who didn't watch the trailer and then i added another thing is i think that one line where steve is telling diana you know what you have to do is basically him telling her you have to stop maxwell which also means that i'm going to go back to being dead so that he'll have to sacrifice himself again. Huh. Those are all theories. I have I haven't read anything about plot, um, but but somebody didn't like that I was throwing that out there as a theory. <laughs> well, it's pretty sound. Um, yeah. Now, now here's another interesting wrinkle. Um, on the forums, uh, yeah, uh, Hex on the forums asked if uh, that guy who's Maxwell Lord was actually uh, Glorious Godfrey of Darkseid's Elite on Apocalypse. Oh, okay. And, uh, and, you, and you, Matt, told him that that's, that's Max Lord. But uh, I'm thinking Hex might actually turn out to be right in the end after all. Like maybe that's not uh, so much Maxwell Lord per se as it is uh, some other character masquerading as Maxwell Lord to uh, right. you know, g- g- do the dark I, wish fulfillment thing. I actually put that on today, not too long ago, where maybe it'll be a Mandarin where you you think it's Maxwell Lord, but then it winds up being the G uh, Godfrey uh, or G Gordon Godfrey, right? And was... that's why he's able to manipulate people, right? <laughs> yes, and uh, you know, given how uh, the the DC cinematic universe seems to be uh, privileging uh, Dark Side and Apocalypse as a source of villains, you know, witness the Justice League movie. Yeah. That's it. Seems yeah. a direction which they'd be likely to go. Plus, we've already had one scenario where the main villain was pretending to be another character for most of the movie in the sure. first Wonder Woman movie. Sure. So. And since Hollywood has a tendency to self-repetition, there's no reason to think they wouldn't do the same thing again. Yeah. Another theory I'm going to throw out there just because I kind of want it to be true is that uh, Maximo Lord is actually Dr. Psycho. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'll take any version of Maxwell well Lord. I mean, even we had it in the Supergirl series, I think it was the second season, which I, I wanted more of, the, of the, the Justice League characters mentioned somewhere, which never happened, but... Um, yeah, it was it was fun to see Max Lord. So whether this is or isn't coming up, I'll still take it for a while. It, it, it's fun to think that he's out there again. Yeah, I think they just used the name because it's just such an '80s power. Uh, yeah, yeah, kind of name. <laughs> and, and and think of think of the uh, the life that Pedro Pascal is living for himself right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Pedro. Game of Thrones to one, <clears throat> you know, to to Wonder Woman to now being in what is actually according to numbers. At this point, the highest watching show on in in if you want to say quote unquote television, but the world is watching The Mandalorian right now. Yeah, <laughs> it's fantastic. Are you let's, Shane? Oh my God, yeah, I love it. Well, let's okay. pivot. Let's talk about it, gentlemen. Yep. Well, let me. I, I do have a quick question. If we're going to talk about The Mandalorian, sure. And I was always under the impression Boba did, wasn't a man. Mandalorian, he just had the Mandalorian armor, as in like he killed a Mandalorian and took the armor, or he scavenged and made that. Was is Boba Fett an actual is or was a Mandalorian like no, not. this particular Mandalorian? Or he just like I thought he just took the costume from somebody, the, the armor. He he is in the armor. He is he is not an actual Mandalorian. Uh, yeah. Bo- Boba Fett okay. Boba Fett is the quote unquote son of the of the you know the 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 bounty hunter that. Uh, you know, wound up. You know, uh, well, he's the son of Jango Fett. And Jango, yeah, Jango Fett was the, basically the genetic template for all the clones. Right, but was he a Mandalorian, or he again? He just took a Mandalorian's armor 
how how he obtained it, we don't know. But he, he was, I was always under the impression that character never really was a Mandalorian. Yeah, he was not a Mandalorian. He definitely took okay. that armor from somebody. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mando, however, I can't believe his name is freaking Mando. I hope it's <laughs> yeah. not his real name. <laughs> no, no, he he has a different name. <laughs> okay, good. First name Mando, last name Lorian. Uh, <laughs> um, is is an excellent character and one that I. If you told me that that a character that you never get to see his face <coughs> be able to express as well as he does, uh, I would not have believed it. And yet, I I believe the Mandalorian. I believe it is the best take on Lone Wolf and Cub that I have seen yeah. outside of Lone Wolf and Cub. <laughs> well, the other thing that's great about the show that I, I'm thoroughly enjoying is that it, it's it's tipping the hat to all of the. Uh, influences that Lucas sort of all put together in in, in this stew that, it, that that Star Wars came out of. I mean, it's a Western. Um, the episode of the defending the village that's Kurosawa's Seven Samurai. Sure. Um, it, it's just it's it's a sheer delight to, to that you know Favreau knows the well he's going to and he's he's drinking from it heartily. I I appreciate all the Easter eggs they throw in and all the. Um Things we've never been able to see. Like I loved in the first episode seeing an IG unit in action, doing. Oh, that stuff. was so cool. Um, I liked his um, Mandalorians discussions or or, or um, collaboration with the IG unit. Well, now I will self destruct. No, we're not. We're going to shoot ourselves out. Stop it. Um, I I just thought it was brilliantly laid out. I also enjoyed the and I, now. I have not seen this past Friday's episode yet. I apologize, but um, uh, always in the periphery, you're reminded that the empire has fallen, yes, mm-hmm. and the chaos that that has created, and that they're on the outer rim, so the Republic really isn't even there to deal with anything. And the fact that they show out of work stormtroopers now reduced to like mercenary bodyguards <laughs> um, was just a great touch. Yeah, and and they still can't shoot. No, no, no. <laughs> and and I know. So when I, in that first episode, when he went to get the job from what looks like an old imperial guy with the stormtroopers guarding him, the doctor comes out. I didn't catch this until it was brought up on the internet somewhere that the patch on the shoulder of the doctor is a clone patch that all the Jango Fett clones wore on their uniforms mm, when they uh-huh. were being schooled on Kamino. So I went back and looked at a couple things, and, and th- they're right. So in some way, that guy is attached to Camino, the cloners. It was just interesting. Like, usually I could pick up on some of that stuff. I completely missed that one. Shane, nicely done. I, well, it wasn't me. I, I read it on the Internet. I have to say one of the things that, uh, I mean, I, it looked decent once I watched it. This is actually my favorite type of, of uh, character. I guess I would say the uh, uh, the the, the Ronin, the, the 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 outlaw, the errant knight, if you will, just someone like Mad Max was, um, just someone kind of like Pat and comes across people that his particular his or her particular set of skills are just help them with a specific problem. He does what he can, he or she does what needs to be done, and just moves on, and then has another situation. And I know I was just listening to. Some people didn't care for the one directed by Bryce Howard. Uh, Bryce Howard. Uh, no, I can't Bryce, remember. Bryce Dallas, Dallas Howard. Howard. That's it. Um, the one with the village. And that's actually probably my favorite episode because I thought that, same, that same illustrated the, yeah. the, the the best of uh, that type of character that I like to see. And I, I was recently reading that Pedro Pascal wasn't even in the suit for the majority of the episode because he was off rehearsing for a, a play he's going to be doing. And one of the stand-ins in the suit is actually the son of John Wayne, or <laughs> grandson of John. <laughs> oh, wow. That would be the wow. grandson um, at this point, yeah. And they collaborated, though, about, you know, I guess, ask each other, why did you move this way in that particular scene or that one, so that they could keep things consistent. Um, so I thought that was a neat little tidbit when you think about, hopefully you don't think about the racism, but John Wayne being this kind of tough gunslinger type of thing, and then a descendant of his is actually kind of continuing that. Yeah. Um, in, in some aspect, but I, 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 I'm, I'm kind of over for baby Yoda. I know that's this big phenom that's going on right now. 
<clears throat> usually the less of that character I see, the 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 happier I feel because I kind of I know it, it, it's essential to to the story, but I, I just kind of and that. It, hasn't really knocked me over like it has i guess just about everybody else well call call me a sucker but i'm knocked over because <laughs> pr- pretty much every single time he's on the screen i i i awe and, and and wind up falling for for the damn thing all over again i love that they mainly are using a puppet here with with occasional cgi thrown in uh it's it it, it makes it makes the the movements of the character look so much more genuine mm-hmm. uh, and i yeah, I, I I really appreciate it, and you know nobody knew this going in. Like it was the best kept secret until that, episode one aired. That's what I like. It's, it was a great secret. Nobody yes. had any clue. Yep. But yeah. I, I still think Gizmo when I see it. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Big Jim Miller that's... posted a cartoon he drew to Facebook of yeah. uh, of a uh, Gizmo uh, standing at his bathroom mirror, kind of uh, rubbing his face like hmm, I should shave. And then when he gets done shaving, he's standing there going, Ah, I'm Baby Yoda now. <laughs> I just keep waiting for it to go. Bagawai. <laughs> you know, Shane, I I watched Gremlins a few months ago. I hadn't watched it in quite oh, a long time. Bum, 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 and it's always, it's so fun and revelatory to be reminded of how dark that film is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and thinking about it when I went to see it as a kid, <laughs> and just it's such a delightfully creepy film. Yep. Uh, and there's there's a lot of Merry dark Christmas. stuff going on in that movie. <laughs> <laughs> I, I forget where, but I was scrolling through. It might have been Disney. Plus, scrolling through, and it said about holiday movies, <clears throat> for, you know, because of Christmas, and that was one of them. I was like, "Oh, that's right. It does take place at Christmas." So, oh, yeah. even yeah, though my yeah. favorite Christmas movie is Die Hard, yeah, yeah, that yeah. could be another one that might make its way into the rotation this year <laughs> well, uh, to watch. Well, I mean, honestly, my favorite holiday, my favorite Christmas movie is clearly Iron Man Three. I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, I'm 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 loving the series, and uh, my favorite episode was the Bryce Dallas episode, uh, Howard uh, directed episode, just for the village and you know everything that that they were that they were pulling off in that. So I, yeah. I I I cannot wait to see where this where the show is going. And oh, just yeah. Overall, I'm I'm all in. So. I had to um, I had to nudge my boys just a little bit to watch it. Um, and they watched the first episode all separately, and then they started asking questions. We started sitting down, and now we're pretty much watching it together sometime during that Friday when it airs. They may have watched it once before, like during a break at school or something, or before they before I get home. But somehow we watch it together at some point and talk about it then. So I'm I'm getting a kick out of it that way too. Let me ask you: Do you, do you, do you like the format of yeah, you know, like a regular TV series as opposed to, to Netflix that just gives you everything that you can binge watch? I do, yeah. I do, because I don't I don't like things that are put out there all at one time. Because even if they are, I don't binge watch them. I make them last. I watch it one episode a week, maybe twice a week if I, if it's really something that grips me. But I like just one episode a week. I'm perfectly happy with that. Because I I like. The, the binge, binge, binge watch, even though it probably takes me about two weeks to cover like a Netflix series. Well, I should say the Marvel series on Netflix that I watch. But I think for what Disney Plus is going to be doing, at least from the Marvel aspect, is probably going to pay off because there's a good chance as one of, let's say, uh, was it a Falcon and Winter Soldier? As that oh. starts to wind down, there might be a small break before the next series picks up. So even though if they do another season of of uh, Falcon and Winter Soldier, there's if you're following the universe, there's going to be en- enough going through. Whereas, in if you binge it, it could be a year before the next series comes out. Yeah. Whether it's you know the the next season of Falcon and, and Winter Soldier, um, you, you know the Wandavision or whatever. So I, I think from that model, it probably works out that there's less lead time, so you're keeping people more and more invested. Yep. As it, opposed it, it, to just blowing their load at. They released the first pr- production skill, uh, pr- production still of Wandavision, by the way, and it looks like I Love Lucy, and, yeah. And I am, I am so sold. I they are gonna go, ah. they are gonna go full fledged Tom King insanity on this one. I can Good. tell, and it's it's gonna be it's gonna be great. <laughs> Have you guys talked on the the show about Disney Plus? Who, who's on it? Do, do you like? Uh, the, the, is it like okay? 
I mean, we, we talked a little bit about it uh, before, okay. before it launched. Um, and I I signed up for the three year plan uh, did I. when it was available. I did too. Uh, so so I wound up, I wound up doing it for for, for that. Um, so uh, I, I'm 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 in for as long as that takes, and probably after that. But yeah. uh, it I haven't had any issues with streaming like other people did me when either. it first launched. No, um, me either. It's not pretty, from day one. Pretty, yep. <laughs> Were you happy to actually see the stuff that was on there? Yeah. Uh, if, if by stuff you mean that that's on there, you mean watching gargoyles nonstop? Yes. Well, Between yeah, just I I was surprised what movies that they brought out, what TV. Series. I mean, I the first thing I knew, I kind of knew it was on there, but the first thing I knew I was going to watch and before I watched anything else was Spider Man and His Amazing Friends. Yep. And it, it was annoying my wife because I was like, no, no, I can't do anything. I know I've seen these a hundred times. I'm not doing anything during this time frame because I'm reliving my childhood right now, and I want to watch freaking. And I didn't realize how many plot holes there are in those episodes. But I have oh, a yeah. question. <laughs> yeah. This is Spider Man and his freaking amazing friends. The only episodes they don't have is the uh, I think number thirteen with the Red Skull, right. which I kind of figured they wouldn't put in. But uh, and then I'm, I'm now I'm getting into the '80s, uh, the one that appeared right before. I, I'm loving it. I mean, the Apple Dumpling Gang is in there. Um, was it Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea? Yep. Smith. Family Robinson. I, somebody was complaining, of, you know, it's a lot of nostalgia stuff, and I'm thinking, I'm looking for, some, but there's no place to grow, and I'm thinking, there's a lot of backlog stuff. That I remember as a kid, I can't wait to plow through. Between was, Gargoyles, Ducktales, Spider-Man stuff that's out there, X-Men, uh, movies like The Snowball Express, The Cat from Outer Space, Darby O'Gill and the Little People, oh, it, it, uh-huh. the Aristocats. Um, uh, oh God! What's the other? I one? watched. I watched Robin the Rescuers, Hood. Robin Hood. I mean, oh. the, some, I have some of these over the years, but I like that I have access to the quote vault, and there is yeah. no more vault. There are things that are missing, but I es- expect them to come. Some things like, um, like National Treasure, the first one isn't on there, but there's a date when it's going to come because whenever its mm-hmm. contract ends with whatever right. service it's on now. But then there's things like the world's greatest athlete that is completely absent, which um, I loved as a kid watching that on HBO. I can't wait for that to come at some point. I hope it comes. It, it should. It's a Disney movie. Um, yeah. It's a lot of fun. Bed knobs and broomsticks. That's another oh, one. I that's love that movie. My favorites. Oh, God, oh yeah. I forgot about that. I kind of love to see if they have a secret agent man. Then on Sunday nights they did like a Walt Disney Hour. The Wonderful too, like World of Disney movie. The Wonderful and I World. I think of there was Disney one where it was a secret agent man where. The twin brother, the brother I had to take. I remember he had this thing was a Corvette and had no handles to get in, but he had to say, "Hey," be-, and that would open up the, the the car. I remember he was running to get to the car and he passed the woman. He said, "Hey, beautiful," and I think she slapped him in the face. Love this woman, but th- those type of things I got to look for. But I do want to ask, what do you think? Some of the stuff like Dumbo, I guess, has a disclaimer on it about basically, "Hey, this stuff it was wasn't good then, but it was kind of, by today's standard." It doesn't look so bad. Uh, it, uh, sorry, it looks bad. But here's the original version of Dumbora. I think I'm not sure if they did Lady and the Tramp. If that's even on there, the, I know, uh, the, I the, the animated movie. But uh, it, well, Lady and Lady and the Tramp is definitely on there because they did the Lady and the Tramp live, live action uh, for yeah. the for the series. Is, I mean for the service as well. Um, I, I get why they did it, but at the same time, it's basically just covering their asses. You know, it's the reason why, you know, Song of the South will never be on here. Yeah. It's culturally insensitive, and I understand, you know, why they did it. But it's 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 just one of those things where, like, you know, times change, and you have to make a decision as to whether or not you're just going to, you know, put your catalog up, you know, carte blanche, and wait for people to complain, or cover your asses and say, just so you guys know, we're warning you, we wouldn't make this today. Have fun watching it. Yeah. Like, that's well, it. I think I think that I think that's the best way to handle it because I'm always uncomfortable when uh, history is whitewashed. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and but at the same time, like I I can live with never seeing Song of the South. Like I'm completely fine with that on so many levels. But um, you know, a lot a lot of these films and like you can like we mentioned John Wayne before. If you watch some John Wayne movies now, holy mackerel. Um, but there's there's an importance there, a cultural significance for a whole host of reasons, and you put your disclaimer up, like like Ian said, so because we live in the world's most litigious society, so you've covered yourself, 
and then you know people can make their own judgment. Well, Again, they, I, I I prefer to be left to make my own judgment. They did the same thing when releasing Tom and Jerry cartoons on DVD years ago. Whoopi Goldberg was in a like a like a precursor part explaining a very similar thing. Like, hey, this wouldn't be made this way now, but this is the way it was. Mm. I appreciated that. Right, so we're talking about uh, Tom and Jerry's owner, who was kind of like a, a black mammy figure yeah, in some yeah, of those old cartoons. Yeah. And 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 I appreciate the explanation. Like the 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 person that voiced that character was a very acclaimed, successful operatic singer, and loved doing it from everything that I've ever read. But I appreciate because like like you, Chris, I don't want it just wiped away. It it's part of what happened. It's part of how things were created. It's the media that was put out there. I I like that they put that well, in there. I could curl all the shame because it. it if you want to try to appreciate the, the where we are today and the historical context of how we got here, for better or for worse, depending on what issue you're talking about, right. you need you need to explore all of that. Yeah. And and that kind of media, especially when we're talking about like the mid 20th century, I mean, film was one of the besides radio was one of the main driving forces of of mass media. So you're going to see the culture reflected in that and what was. Things that were condoned or weren't even considered that they might, you know, be today. It's, it's. I mean, in that sense, it's. I can see how some of it is is painful. Yeah. Um, and I would never diminish that, but at the same time, I think it's necessary. Yeah. I, so it was just watching. I, I forget how long ago it was but when Galaxy Quest came out. Uh, it was it was on uh, one of the Sling channels I was watching the other day, and I had forgotten that Tony Shalhoub plays. Uh, it's supposed to be a, a an Asian. And at the end of the of the episode or end of the movie, you know the series is coming back. The journey continues, and you see him and the uh, Jane Doe uh, working on something. And he he squints his eyes and nods, and that's when the the clip ends on on whatever channel I was watching. And I, I thought, I mean, would that not be considered uh, in twenty nineteen? You could easily look at that and say, "Yeah, it's kind of offensive for one of an Asian descent." Just, just, just a little bit that he did, just squint his eyes and just nodding his head forward. Um, yeah. Now, I don't think there was a disclaimer at the beginning of that, but at the end, I was just thinking, you know, there's, there's so many things beforehand that I just, you know, and I apologize, I just never interpreted his way. Some people did, but I could obviously see the way the the world, you know, the, the society that we live in now, how. There's some things back in the day. I remember having a conversation. I think Adam, you were there. Uh, that I never saw Dukes of Hazard for the way that it's being interpreted now. Um, but now you can't even buy a General Lee because it has the Confederate flag on there. And, and I understand um, what that represents to some people, even though that's never what it represented to me. Right. Seeing that on the car, even though I know the car was ge- the General Lee. But right. so I, I thought it was interesting. That they did a disclaimer before and and. And I agree. We shouldn't whitewash what happened before, but it should be kind of like a, a learning tool, I guess, going forward. Well, we, we should all learn more than anything else from Short Circuit, not <laughs> Pat Fisher Stevens as an Indian man. Let's just. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, gentlemen, I have to depart because I have to get up at 530. One, 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 one moment, Chris, before sure. you do, uh, what we should do our mailbag since that it, since there is a piece. Oh, of yes, please, please. Well, uh, yeah. so ahead, heard, uh, do the honors. Mm, happy to, my friends. Um, OK, uh, we, we did receive a holiday package uh, here at uh, the studio. It's the holiday season. The holiday season. And it's from Ryan Drost, Royal Lantern of the Star Joes podcast. And uh, Ryan has sent along some goodies for all of us. And he enclosed a letter. In which he writes, uh, Hey guys, I wanted to send a thank you gift for all of the many years of doing the show. I believe I started listening around episode 600 or just before that and have gone back to listen to all of the episodes preceding it. Have not missed an episode since then. Love the days of Super Show and always thrilled when you guys have a full house for an episode. And this is the fullest house we've had in a little bit. Um, So uh, he's uh, sending us along all these, uh, these good things. Uh, it says, the first couple items are a couple of digest trades of Star Wars adventures. I would appreciate it if you could make sure these get to pants for his nephew. And uh, we actually did to have a pants sighting here in the studio just before we began recording. So he uh, wants to let all you folks out there in CGS know that he's alive and well and gainfully employed. And uh, just uh, chugging along at his uh, work 
uh, for a company called Anderson Stocking uh, Displays for some local stores. And uh, so, um, sorry we didn't get to this uh, while he was still yeah, here. Cause, yeah, right. Well, we'll see to it that he gets uh, these things uh, you know, for his nephew Alexander. Um, let's see. On uh, to the rest, which is for all of you. There is a hardcover trade of IDW's Revolution series, which brings together so many wonderful Star Joes related properties. Because yep. that's mm. what that's the thrust of the Star Joes podcast. It's dedicated to uh, Star Wars, GI Joe, Transformers, and lots of other uh, wonderful nostalgic uh, entertainment properties of the '80s and beyond. Um, so the art for the main revolution story was fantastic, and the story was a great fun read. I thought of Shane with this one, since he is such a fan of all the same properties I love, and Shane is already sniffing it. Oh, yeah. Does it pass? <laughs> Passes the test. <laughs> all right. Uh, next is the hardcover collection of G.I. Joe Cobra, called The Last Laugh. I thought of Chris with this one, because he had oh. mentioned how he would like to read it one day. This is my personal favorite G.I. Joe story ever told, and you know Ryan oh. has read quite a few. If you like the animated G.I. Joe Resolute, Chris, you are going to adore I this do. story. And if you ever do a book review of it, I want in. Ha ha. Um, yeah, we sold. Yeah, oh, thank no. you, sir. Well, we, we owe Ryan a little. Yes, not, we not, do. Not, not for the gifts, but uh, we, we invited him to participate in a Star Wars-related uh, episode that uh, we never got off the ground due to technical difficulties here in the studio. So and we, do, we do apologize for that, Ryan, and we'll, we'll get you on here to talk about something Star Joe's worthy at some point in time. Thank you. Underneath that are the hardcover volumes one and two of the Marvel Darth Vader series by oh. Kieran Gillen and Salvador La Roca. Oh, so good. Like, nice. a, like a few of you had said, this is probably the best series of Star Wars material Marvel has done, though most of the Star Wars stuff they do is great overall. He doesn't say who that's for, so I guess it's up for grabs. <laughs> uh, let's see. Lastly, I had Murd in mind with the hardcover collection, sorry Murd, they don't make a softcover edition yet, of the Masters of the Universe mini comics collection. This coll <laughs> And Shane is just handing it to me and there's nothing mini about it. My, it's look at massive. This. It's a brick. Uh, this collects all of the mini comics that came with the figures, vehicles, and play sets back in the 80s. I remember seeing the solicitation for this yep. in the Dark Horse section of previews a while back and I, I did not uh, throw that into my cart, but now Ryan has dropped it into my lap. Thank you, Ryan. This is fine artifact of one of my favorite uh, 80s toy series. Uh, I hope you get hours of enjoyment from these stories, just like I got hours of entertainment from your show. Thank you again, and remember, the Force will be with you because knowing us is half the battle. <laughs> Ryan <laughs> Droz! <Ryan>. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. So Much appreciated. All hail the Royal cool. Lantern. Thank you. Thank you very Indeed. much for your holiday generosity, Ryan. These are some great gifts. Yes, yes, yes. All right, brothers, forgive me. I must retire. No. Yeah, I'm, I'm coming to my pumpkin, too. I have to get up at yeah. 5.30 tomorrow morning. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> All right. Well, we understand, Chris. Go and, uh, and rest. May flights of angels sing thee to it. All right, all right, brothers. Yeah, sorry, that was I will uh, talk to you all very soon. See you. All right, <laughs> good night. Good night, night Chris. Have a good one, Chris. You too. Take care, guys. Bye. All right. Hey, so, it, oh, are we gonna look into uh, talk about Ghostbuster Afterlife trailer? Oh yeah, yeah. that's that, that's a good point, sir. That's Here. a good point. You guys do that other than to say I loved it and I'm looking forward to it, but I got to take off as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Early, early morning comes early. Oh yes, <laughs> no worries, man. Much, but one hundred percent understand, and we're we're glad you were able to kill some time with us here yeah, uh, in too. between things. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Hope you have blown off some steam. Yeah, I have. It's been great. Yeah. Thanks. Good All night. right, we'll talk. We'll talk to you in happier times. Sounds good. Um. Yeah. So I I, I saw the Ghostbusters Afterlife trailer. Um, did, did you happen to catch it? Um, I did. I was just in the middle of hugging Shane goodbye. So, uh, nope, Chris. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I have seen that trailer. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I'm not sure yeah. this is exactly the right approach for a Ghostbusters movie. Mm. See, if I can employ kind of a mangled metaphor uh, making reference to yet another beloved 80s property, um, it's kind of like the dark Ghostbusters crystal has cracked. <laughs> and it's and uh, what could be a great twenty uh, teens, twenty twenties uh, Ghostbusters revival film has been fragmented into two races. You've got the twenty sixteen Paul Feig movie, which was kind of the Skeksis. You know, it was just kind of uh, raucously uh, cruel and uh, 
soullessly uh, d d attempting too hard to be funny and uh, missing some of the heart of the original. And now we've got this one, which is a little bit too, from the looks of things, and granted all we've seen is the one teaser trailer, but it looks like it's going to be a little too reverent, a little too uh, slavishly obsequious to the legacy and uh, the, the fondness of people of a certain age for the movie, uh, and it doesn't look like there's going to be that much actual comedy in it. You know, if we can go by what we've seen in this trailer so far. And if we could just find a way to, you know, reintegrate those two, refine the missing shard and drive it back into the crystal and uh, reunite these two... Uh, 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 these two variant races into one movie, I think then we'll have it. Okay. You know, it was after I first saw mm. Ghostbusters that I realized that it was considered a comedy. But I don't remember, I mean, I remember comedic moments, but I don't remember it being, uh, I didn't see the 2016 uh, uh, movie, the reboot or whatever. I, it just didn't look interesting to me from from the previews. And, I, I you know, some people bash it for, for their own reasons. It just didn't look interesting for, for me. And, and uh, so I saw no reason to bash it or, or take anything further. But uh, so I don't know how comedic that was, if that went, you know, to the, too far of an extreme, but I don't remember the original being that fun. And, and maybe it was because they did a lot of voiceover from the original in this one that that it, it felt more in line with at least the first one, probably a little bit of the second one as well. That uh, that I definitely got jazz for it. That I want to see the next trailer to see if it's if it's going to be, um, I guess, kind of crap. Is going to be essentially like the Force Awakens where you're basically just more or less redoing the original story yet again. Or is it going to be kind of a nice closure trilogy for basically the people our age who, you know, it, it was from our youth, even though I know Adam, you only saw it in the last couple of years, but um, yeah. to, uh, to kind of like close out this whole story. Well, I, uh I, I saw a meme going going around the internet uh, the, the day that the trailer came out of uh, Thanos snapping his fingers and making the uh, the the movie from three years ago disappear, and then saying "You're welcome." And then they then they show Paul Rudd from this trailer saying that there haven't been ghosts in thirty years. Um, I I really like this trailer. Uh, I like the feel of it, and I I absolutely adore the shot selection. Like it feels like a it feels like a movie more than it like, or maybe even a film is the mm, word that it for. feels like more a Spielberg than, movie. Yes, it does. Um, and while that may be a little bit different than, you know, a right man movie, yep. um, it's, I'm hoping that it's going to capture the right feel considering the fact that there's so many of the originals involved here. Um, and, and that, uh, I believe Reitman's son uh, wrote, wrote this. Mm -hmm, that's right. And directing it. And, and is directing it. So I would hope that he that he's looking to, as 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 Matt essentially said, write the ship here and, and bring this thing home the way that it was supposed to. Um, I know that uh, there is a video game that was released that many consider to be the third Ghostbusters movie where I think everybody but Bill Murray returned for, for that video game to cast it. Um, I think he did return for that. I read. So he, he considers that the third one. He, he may have. He may have. Uh, you, you may be right. Uh, I may be thinking of something else. But I know that that you know it did have a pretty good uh, uh, plot line to it, and it was basically the Ghostbusters in Hell that was supposed <laughs> to be the original third movie, um, only as a video game. And there's a if you put all the cutscenes together, you get like a 45 minute piece there anyway. But I I sincerely hope that this does a a good enough job of finishing out the story of the Ghostbusters and bringing it to a new generation after this. Um, and I just saw Terminator Dark Fate in theaters, and that was the latest attempt to try and do one of these things. And it's mostly successful. I think it'll be the last Terminator movie for the next 15 years because it basically shot its load and there's nothing else to do here. But... Ghostbusters could easily continue past this next movie if they do it right. I, I, I guess, anyway, I don't want to go off into that tangent. I was looking forward to the Terminator Dark Fate until I found out essentially the first five minutes. Yeah. And as I 
because yeah, you know Linda Carter coming back, um, Linda Hamilton coming back. I was like, all right, Sarah Connor. I know people put out that you know the the women's uh, movement didn't really start until like Wonder Woman came out. To me, it's always going to be Leia. It's always going to be Ripley, and it's going to be Terminator Two. Uh, Linda Hamilton. Yep. As as what I always picture in my mind. So to hear that she came back, I was I was in. But but I I think you're right. I I I think that the opening kind of turned some people off, and I think that's part of why that movie failed. Yeah. And I think going forward, they're better off just saying, you know what, let's just forget this and <laughs> down the line just restart from scratch with yeah. nobody from the original. That, um, that would be that would be the smart road to do, I think, at this point. But uh, Ghostbusters Afterlife. It has me. It has me hooked, and I hope. I hope it actually delivers. Uh, just, just, and and yes, part of that I fully admit is because Paul Rudd's in it, and I love everything that he does. So well, the uh, so, unless I'm wrong, wasn't the farm reference in the first movie Ray's family farm? Yes, yes, it was because this is Spangler's grand grandson. Okay. One, I think it looks like Spangler, and two, I had to freeze frame it for a moment. But when he's touching the the costumes, it says Spangler on it. Mm-hmm. When he says who who is your like who is your dad or who's your grandfather, I forget what it is. Um, but you see that, and I was like, well, the, you know, what's the kind of the explanation? Did, did Egon just decide, yeah, I'm going to get a farm too and retire? Um, I mean, then I also wonder if that's where they stored all the go- if he put all the ghosts underground um, after they moved out of New York. Yeah. I mean, maybe, maybe it's Ray's farm. Maybe you're right. I mean, maybe maybe Egon moved in, uh, and and, uh, and and you know wound up taking that as his as his retirement or something. Because yeah. Ray certainly does look like she's wearing uh, Egon's uh, spectacles. Yeah. So, yeah. Who knows how it's gonna go? Uh, I do have some. I do have some actual comic talk uh, uh, for for you fellas. Uh, if it, if I could just uh, get that out of the way real quick, and then uh, whatever else you guys want to speak of, and then we can go ahead and wrap things up if you don't mind. All right, yeah, proceed. Okay. So uh, this last weekend, I was at Pax Unplugged in Philadelphia. Uh, it's uh, the the uh, the all uh, gaming uh, but not video game convention that uh, that Penny Arcade puts out uh, every year. And it's at the uh, the Pennsylvania Convention Center in Philadelphia, stayed at the Hampton Inn right there, and had a great time. Got to have some amazing uh, Chinese food on the, on the Sunday after the con at the uh, at, in Chinatown, and uh, would recommend. My God, Dim Sum House is freaking fantastic. But on the Friday, I I was walking around. Actually, no, I'm sorry, it wasn't the Friday. It was the Thursday. The Thursday, I was walking around, and I got to actually go to Brave New Worlds for the first time. Um, that's, uh, a comic shop in, in old town in, uh, in, in Philadelphia. And that shop is gorgeous. I, I, I was, I was beyond thrilled with the, with the layout. It's, it, 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 it's got a great combination of, uh, of new and old. Like they have a whole section of, of excellent looking wall books in the, in the back of the, uh, of the place and, uh, very friendly and, and knowledgeable staff and, uh, it's one of those stores that puts up staff picks for uh, for new books that are coming out as well. So uh, you know, if you're walking in there and you're not quite sure what you want to read, uh, just go over to the staff picks and they'll have like you know a, a top ten of books to read, which is always a good thing. And uh, it was, it was, it's a really nice place. Is that the one on Samson? I believe so. Yeah, I think uh, it's like seventeenth or something. I it's been a while since I was in there. A couple of years ago, when I was looking for back issues. Mm-hmm. Um, I stopped and, and I <clears throat> went off the reservation a little bit when I was working in Center City, Philly, and I would stop in there looking for some stuff. And, and uh, you're right. It, it's a nice layout, nice place uh, worth stopping in for. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, I, I, I just I, I love I hadn't I, I, to be honest, I don't think I'd actually been in a comic shop in a while um, just just because of, uh, of the fact that I've that I've gone mostly digital. So this was a, a nice change of pace and uh, just, you know, kind of kind of just makes me feel happy to just be amongst comics every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> I go over to Adam's apartment. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's replaced everything, right? Aren't you just sitting on those instead of sofa? Mm, and chair? Yeah, you, you, you will be amongst comics ahead in my apartment. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> oh, definitely. I, I did. I did pick up the uh, the third volume of Umbrella Academy while I was there because uh, I I. I always like to at least buy something when I'm at a comic shop I haven't been at before, and that, that was one of the books that there was sitting there on the shelf 
uh, in their recommended pile. And I'm like, all right, I've, I've been meaning to buy volume three, so I may as well just go ahead and do so while I'm there. So now I can go ahead and check out what the third volume of Umbrella Academy is like. So that was, that was good stuff. Either of you two read anything? Uh, well, uh, most of, I don't have that much uh, free time for reading right now because uh, my work schedule is a little intense. Uh, yep. you know, Christmas is coming, the goose is getting fat, etc. Um, I do have a couple of things on my nightstand that I try to read a little snatch of every night before passing out. Um, <laughs> one of them is Herman Melville's Moby Dick, uh, which is uh, a fairly dense read. Um, I'm, I'm undertaking that because this uh, is the uh, 200th anniversary of the birth of, uh, of Herman Melville. It's his bicentennial year, so I thought, eh, this is a good time to revisit this thing that I haven't read since I was in fourth grade. Um, uh, more relevant to comics, though, um, the other thing I have on my nightstand right now is actually a collection of British comics. Uh, Eric Nolan Worthington will be proud of me for this. Um, it's uh, something called Steel Commando. Um, it was uh, put out by uh, you know, the 2000 AD Revolution Comics Company, um, and it's reprinting some old uh, uh, humor. It's an old uh, war, like World War II era humor strip. Um, well, it was set during World War II. It was actually published during the first half of the 1970s. Um, and it's, it's kind of like G.I. Robot meets Johnny Thunder and his Thunderbolt. Um, it's about uh, this experimental... Um, army android put together by the regular British army called the Steel Commando, who, due to a quirk in his circuitry, uh, will only accept orders given to him uh, by a a low-ranking, potato-peeling grunt soldier named Ernie Bates, who's kind of like a Beetle Bailey figure. His nickname is Excused Boots because he's got some uh, note from his podiatrist that prevents him from doing anything more active or dangerous than sitting around pulling kitchen duty all the time. Uh, But suddenly Ernie Bates finds himself caught up in the thick of the war because he's this important figure because uh, the experimental robot will only listen to orders that he gives it. So uh, he and the robot get caught up in all these wacky situations, get sent on all kinds of uh, secret missions, military uh, mishap uh, kind of stuff. The stories are all like four pages long. They were all published uh, in the first half of the 70s. Uh, by uh, Frank Pepper, writer, and uh, Alex Henderson, artist. And it, it's, it's lighthearted stuff, and uh, like I said, the stories are only four pages each, so fairly you know, quick read, good thing to just read as a nightcap before dropping off to sleep after a long, hard day of retailing. I can understand that. <laughs> so, yeah, that's my comics reading story. Um, I do have uh, some new comics here that I will be giving a try shortly, though. Uh, Something else out of the CGS mailbag that uh, is definitely uh, meriting a mention on the air. Uh, They were sent to us by our good friend and loyal listener, Chris Beckett. And um, they're they're, they're comics that he thinks uh, deserve a little more attention. Um, uh, They're they're published by a company known variously as Atomic Pulp Media and Atomic Action Comics. Um, they're, they're, it's a self-publishing venture. They're available only through uh, a print-on-demand concern called Indie Planet. Mm. And uh, it, it's uh, the brainchild of a writer named Christopher Mills, who's working in tandem with some uh, artist friends of his with well-known names, uh, Rick Burkett, Paul Pelletier, Peter Grau, Joe Staten, etc. And uh, the, the basic formula is it's... Uh, the Golden Age according to the Bronze Age according to the present day. It's <laughs> uh, revivalism of Bronze Age revivalism of Golden Age characters. It's a like, public domain uh, characters. Um, uh, Chris sent along the first two issues of an anthology called Space Crusaders, featuring Rick Dexter of Mars and Lance Lewis, Space Detective. And also an issue of Sleuth Comics featuring The Black Owl and Mike Lancer Private Eye. So these are all actual uh, older comics characters who have lapsed into the public domain, and they're being uh, done in kind of a 70s uh, style, you know, something on the order of like an Atlas Comics. It's kind of like a, a third publisher approach to reviving older characters as done back in the 70s. And uh, Chris's high concept for all this is public domain characters plus Bronze Age sensibilities plus a writer with three decades of comic publishing experience plus those artists I just reeled off equals damn fun comics. So Chris is apparently really impressed uh, by uh, the output of this company and uh, wants to spread the word. So he sent us these comics, and I will absolutely read them. Thank you, Chris. uh, You are right in thinking that this is uh, 
to my taste because it's exactly the kind of stuff that I do like to read. And um, since it's it, its own little self-contained world, I don't have to worry about uh, you know, keeping straight a lot of continuity while I can barely keep my eyes open after a long day at work. So I think I'll be given, taking these home and giving them a read within the next few days. Nice. Very cool. Yeah, that 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 sounds interesting, especially the uh, like the the time within a time within a time aspect of it. That's uh-huh. that's, that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's mm. very time bubbly. <laughs> well, you, you you did you did spark uh, a a nugget in, in me, uh, Mur, by by mentioning the golden age. That uh, I don't know if you heard, but we're finally getting a Cavalier and Clay series. I saw what you posted on Facebook about that. Mm. This is like a, a Grail adaptation for you, right? Yeah, I've been I've been waiting for this to be a, a, adapted even before I read the damn thing, and I it's one of my favorite books of all time, and it was supposed to be a movie like multiple times, like long enough ago where I think at one point Johnny Depp was attached to it, um, and uh, I think they might have even been uh, trying to get uh, Brad Pitt and a couple other people involved, but it never got off the ground, and now it's going to be a Showtime limited series. Uh, in uh, in later in 2020, once Michael Chabon is done working on Star Trek Picard, him and his wife are going to be the showrunners of this uh, television adaptation of the Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay, and it's uh, a fictional Golden Age tale of uh, of creators uh, creating a a variety of Golden Age characters, including the Escapists. Uh, which is their which is their most popular uh, uh, creation, and I cannot wait to see what they do with this. It it, it better it better work. Let's put it that way. Because <laughs> <laughs> for for something that I that I that I hold in, hold in such fondness, I, I I I cannot wait to see what they do with this. Did you mention where this uh, will eventually be seen, Ian? Yes, uh, it'll be on Showtime. Showtime. Ah, okay. So it is yep. on television. It's just not a uh, kind of television that I can see. Yep. You can get the app. <laughs> sure, I can. <laughs> uh, it, it may it may be it may be available in other ways uh, shortly thereafter. Uh, usually, Showtime shows eventually show up on on other services, uh, whether it be Netflix or whether it be uh, you know other other means. Uh, so uh, that, uh, hopefully, it'll be available in, on DVD or some sort mm. once it's been released. Okay. VHS, VHS, or. <laughs> Uh, real to real, perhaps. Well, yeah, I'm still grateful to the Stranger Things folks for having released that DVD set in the uh, VHS box. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just I'm just curious who they're going to get to play Cavalier and Clay. Whether they get uh, established names or whether they get uh, uh, you know nobodies. So it'll be very interesting to find that out. So that's that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, you got anything? Uh, I, I kind of the uh, uh, so one of the Disney Plus series is is Moon Knight, and uh, again Kevin and I text won't or send articles when we see it, and uh, uh, just to kind of get ramped up for that. Even though I like I, I'm I, I'm excited, but with a lot of reservations because I'm worried that they're going to do this revamped version of Moon Knight that I'm not a fan of. But I've been reading the original series. Um, uh, well, when I when I can, I, unfortunately, I'm getting this old man situation where if I sit down for like 10, 15 minutes, even if I just watch TV, I have a tendency to nod off. So kind of <laughs> being able to stay up to read is getting uh, more and more difficult. Mm-hmm. But uh, so I've, I've been kind of looking to reread the original run. Um, I, you know what? Ian, if you don't mind me asking, and I feel as though sometimes these conversations go in like a, a, a third rail type of thing. But what the fuck? I'm, I'm sure I've already done that before. Uh when they first announced this and, and people were commenting and stuff like that, there was uh, one of the ideas is should the series to add diversity uh, make the character um, a different ethnicity? Sure. And, and I was a proponent of saying, in this instance, I think you can get diversity by keeping uh, the fact that you have uh, a Jewish character that alone, because aside from daredevil they really don't touch on religion at all Mm -hmm. um but from that aspect alone you're actually adding a different diverse character to the if you touch on that aspect but at the same time 
nodding that his current mindset is following a, an Egyptian religion. So I was wondering, do, do you see that that is kind of not just another quote unquote white guy, but as someone who would be um, of Jewish faith, being a character, if they touch on those aspects of him that, that actually bring the diversity that, that, that I, I think would, you know, always be progressive, taking the universe steps forward. Oh yeah, no, sure. Uh, especially, especially when it comes to the, to the superhero universe, like I, I can't for the life of me think of any adaptations that have been made so far other than the fantastic four and Ben Grimm. Mm hmm that have had Jewish characters, uh, you know, in, in the forefront. So I, I think that that would be really cool to just keep Mark, you know, uh, Mark Spector, Mark Spector and, you know, um, embrace that, that part of him and, you know, just make that a little bit more prominent. Uh, now if you do want diversity, I mean, you don't have to necessarily, uh, you know, cast an Ashkenazi, you know, you can, mm. you can have him be a Sephardic Jew. You could have him be anything along those lines, uh, while still keeping the Judaism at the front. Um, so, yeah, no, I, I'd, I'd love to see them keep that aspect of the character just because I've always found that to be unique. I mean, sure, it's about a crazy guy, but, uh, <laughs> but you know, uh, at, at the same time, uh, that's not just what it's about. Um, right. So, yeah, no, I, I, I'd, I'd like to see them keep that aspect of the character, definitely. Yeah, and I know they've been kicking around a lot of different names, and I know, like, Shia LaBeouf was one of them. Oh, and it, I, I, one of the things reaching is because he's actually Jewish, so there'd be some, you know, authenticity to his casting. Sure. Um, but I, I, I don't know. I, I'm kind of up in the air with him because I sometimes I think it's a short, crazy train ride for him on situ certain situations. And I hate for them to cast any type of character who is questionable and figuring it's going to be another Robert Downey Jr. who's going to you know, be good and be able to ride the train. I and just then it winds up being someone who's derails quick. I just saw Honey Boy uh, in in theaters a couple of weeks ago, and I, I'm disappointed that as of now, uh, with with the awards shows that have uh, that have announced what their nominees are, he he isn't on the list because Honey Boy is is one of my favorite movies of 2019, if not my favorite movie of 2019, mm. and and Shia uh, is so passionate and dedicated in that. And he, he, he actually, uh, made sure that he got himself clean for the peanut butter Falcon movie that he yeah. did earlier this year. And he stuck to it. And I think that if he is able to actually keep that going, just like Robert Downey did, I mean, just like we were talking about, yeah. I, I think that this could be the change in career path that Shia is looking for. And, yeah, man, if, if they could if they could attach him to Moon Knight and it doesn't go off the rails, it could work really, really well. Because I, I to some extent, I think with his casting, if you I mean, not nah, I'm not a religious person and not that it, it's an addiction, but but so Moon Knight or Mark Spector is always kind of his dad was a rabbi and mm -hmm. that he he was he walked away from he had wanted nothing to do with that. And and sometimes that stuff would, would creep back, especially during his first series. I think essentially during his first series. Um, his past um, with the Jewish faith would, would pop in. So I kind of wonder if, to some extent, having something that you're trying to walk away from, and in Shia LaBeouf's uh, case, addiction issues that he would have, sure. um, could that work for him as, you know, it's not it would be more like the religious side. So oh, yeah. just kind of swapping that out. So you'd still kind of have, cause I, I thought the same thing with, with Robert Downey Jr. Once you saw him as Tony Stark, mm -hmm. it, they didn't really do the demon in the bottle, but at the same time he had demons that he's always trying to be better from. And that's why, you know, he gave up uh, the character, gave up making weapons and to, to be more for humanity. So it's not the same as an addiction, but the same way he was trying to separate himself from the past, his past, just like Robert Downey Jr. Was right. Yeah, no, it, it's it could it could easily work for him. Um, I 
In fact, now now I can't stop thinking about it. And, fr- and fr- <laughs> fr- frankly, that's my casting. So if, if they if they go that route, I will be very happy. But uh, the the thing about fan casting is that a lot of a lot of the times it's it's so perfect in your head, and yet it's not what you wind up getting on the screen. Like I I had uh, uh, Danny Houston in my not not Danny Houston uh, the other Houston uh, or is it Danny Houston? Uh, that that there's so many there's so many Houstons. Angelica Houston's uh, uh, cousin. Uh, with, with the with the mustache, uh, something Houston. Anyway, uh, he was in Boardwalk Empire, and I had him fan cast in my head as Doctor Strange for years, and they didn't actually wind up going that direction. But to me, he's still Doctor Strange. <laughs> mm. um, but uh, there's nothing I can do about it. So to me, Shia LaBeouf is now is now Moon Knight. It is head cannon. It has been. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know. I know you want to. to- I guess we're going to be wrapping up because of the late hour, but I know you want to talk about Watchmen. I haven't been watching that, but I've heard a lot of people have been raving about that. Uh, um, the, oh, yeah. uh, the, the HBO series. Is that yep. something that um, you've been bowled over and you're... Uh... Yeah. Uh, first off, it was Jack Houston. That was the name that I was, I was trying to find. Danny Houston is, is, is uh, I think, is, uh, his uncle. But uh, yeah, Jack, Jack Houston was the actor I was thinking of. Uh, Watchmen... Okay, I started reading Doomsday Clock when, when it was coming out. We've talked about it tons of times on the show, how I just stopped reading it because, frankly, I was going to wait till it all came out. I'll go ahead and, and reread it because I have no idea where I left off. And for all I know, it was issue two, even though I'm sure it was issue five. Um, so I'll go ahead and read all 12 issues of that as it goes. Of Watchmen sequels, the show does it better. Mm. And I'm, I'm sticking with that. Um, it feels like Watchmen in some very important ways. Um, for me, they get the, like the multiple settings and scenarios down, right. Um, they get different, uh, you know, di- different, different styles down as well like like you you go from uh like almost like a like a courtroom drama thing that's going out with uh with uh the ozymandias character to Mm -hmm. a a mystery that's that's unfolding in in tulsa oklahoma uh with uh with with our main our main lead uh you get uh you know where is dr manhattan and, and what's happening with him uh you get a all all while this is going down this show's version of the uh, of the pirate uh, comic is essentially a American hero story in the way that we have American horror story and American crime story of, mm-hmm. of hooded justice that's airing on television, and we keep getting intercut snippets of of what that world's you know television looks like, and all, all these different things are going down, and to me it takes everything that worked in a show like the leftovers uh, and just uses all of that momentum to, to get something brilliant. I, it's it just David, David Lindelof, David Lindelof is proving something on this, that loss was not his fault. <laughs> yeah. Um, he was given a, fa- a flawed pro- project to begin with. He was given J.J. Abrams' half idea and then told to roll with it. And he, and he ended it as, as quickly as, 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 and as well as he could with what he was given. Then he, hit, then he did The Leftovers. Some, one of my favorite shows in, in, in all my life is The Leftovers uh, by the time that, that three-season show concludes. And we are one episode away from the ninth concluding episode of, the, of Watchmen. And I know Alan Moore is never going to watch this show because he could give two shits, but this is a, this is a spiritual successor in every single way to the works of Alan Moore and, and, and Dave Gibbons. It's, it's, it's brilliant. Well, I have a couple of things. One, is this a one and done or are they going to squeak out seasons out of this? I have heard it was a one and done, but then I heard that, there's that it might they might be looking to expand it. 
I didn't know he's being was... very cagey about it. He's being very okay. cagey about it. Um, to, uh, he's, he said that he may only have one season worth of story, but then he's also hinted that there might be more. Um, we are definitely coming to the conclusion of the story that's being told here, but there's still so many questions left unanswered uh, that you could easily get more of this. Um, and just really, it, it's, it's all in the cast. Like, every single uh, person on the screen is is acting a tour de force in this that i just i'm i'm it's appointment television for me like i i watch it the minute that it's available on hbo go i mean you know jeremy irons as ozymandias yeah it just blows me out of the way out of the water like it's it's amazing just how good a job he does tim blake nelson plays a character on this uh, on this show as well uh called looking glass that's sort of like the spiritual successor in some ways to Rorschach and and some of the other mysteries that they have in here. Um, like there's there, it's not a spoiler to say because they, they announce it in like almost like in the teaser for the show. But there's uh, like a, a white nationalist group that's using Rorschach's mask and journal as a uh, as, as sort of like a message um, and 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 their reason for existing. And and they're one of the major enemy groups that uh, that Tulsa and the rest of the world are dealing with. And there was an incident a couple of years before the show started that then led cops in Tulsa to all wear masks. So they are essentially the vigilantes. Mm. And and we go from there. Um, I, will, I will not tell you much else because pretty much everything else is legitimately going to be a spoiler. But I will say that it all unfolds beautifully. And it, it, I'll see what happens after this next episode. Well, I already know some of it that uh, even the actor playing the role didn't know that he was playing the role that that's, was revealed last week or was revealed this week. I yeah. think um, Silk Spectre wants to be an FBI agent. They see an elder yes. version of her. And um, there was something else. Oh, yeah. oh that, that they kind of tweet hooded justice's uh identity mm-hmm. uh, if, if i recall correctly to it was hinted in the in the manuscript as um as one person but that they were leaning towards no it was somebody else who just used some makeup mm-hmm. in certain aspects yeah uh but but i i want that zach snyder gets a lot of shit for what he did um with, with the dc movies um, and and that, that's that's subjective. I wanted to get that I think his ultimate cut of Watchmen is one of the best comic book movies I've ever watched. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, does this series kind of have that same type of feel, like it's just a continuation of his movie, or this kind of feels completely separate from what what that movie by just being a continuation of of the the feel, but live act like it, this is it, a nice continuation that you could measure. This is a continuation of the comic. This is not a continuation okay. of the comic. And, and I will give you two words, which, again, not a spoiler, especially if you've read the original Watchmen, but I, I will give you two words that 100% cements this as a, as a sequel to the comic and not the movie. Giant squid. Oh. Okay. Well, I, I was going to go for, like, the look of it. Does it look like yes. it, it's in the same tone and same matter as the movie, um, as opposed to kind of being, like, something that, that wouldn't match together i understand that plot point in the movie was different but it's 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 much closer i i would say in visual style to the comic than it is to okay. the movie. uh even in costuming um because ozymandias is uh you know wearing at times an outfit that's straight out of the comics like there there's there's no variation there whatsoever um and uh you know while they do they, they did definitely learn some things from, from Zack Snyder's vision. And I'd say the American crime story, which is making, you know, in some ways making jest of, you know, the darker gritty takes on, 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 excuse me, on superheroes mm-hmm. is closer to Zack Snyder's version of Watchmen than the actual show Watchmen is. Do you think this hurts the, the, the books then, the, uh, the sequels that have come out as kind of, um, my, my interpretation the reason why I haven't read any of the, the stuff they put out since the original book and mm-hmm. the movie was I just kind of felt like what it was was great 
Yeah. And now you're kind of just trying to go back to a well that was that's empty, and you keep using it for other stuff. And I and I can see why. You know, the creators would get kind of irritated that sure. we did something great, and now you're just, just like. And I always come back to the Dark Knight Returns is great, and then the sequels kind of <laughs> because the sequel sucked. It brought down the the, the greatness of the Dark Knight Returns. Yeah. Do Do you think because of the reception of the show that they're going to keep trying to use that material or do you kind of in your mind, this should just be it that, you know, just, just let, let that whole, those characters and stuff just go. You're just kill. You're kicking a dead horse. That's not even, you know, the flesh is already off of it. It's just skin and bone or, or just bones. At this point. I think that, uh, it will not be the TV show that kills any potential Watchmen sequels in, in comic book form. I think it will be the extreme lateness okay. that, that killed any sequels to Watchmen because had Doomsday Clock came out the way that it was going to, there'd still be hype around that right now. Like we would have had Doomsday Clock's conclusion before this Watchmen series even came. You know, it had it actually come out on time and then we'd be able to say, oh, we can compare the two like, oh, you know, like which one did it better? Like, you know, was integrating it into the DC universe a good idea or was it keeping keeping it standalone a good idea? And we could go, you know, b- back and forth on that. Well, we mm-hmm. can still do that. We still haven't gotten issue 12 of Doomsday Clock, so we don't even know how that's going to end yet. Uh, it's supposed to be coming out in the next couple of weeks. So there will be time to compare, you know, episode nine of this to issue 12 of that. But. I'm thinking DC is just going to let that go a little bit because even their own comic universe has, because all the things that <laughs> say clock was supposed to reveal and, and move forward have already moved forward in DC's own continuity. Oh, like, wow. you know, Justice society is already, is already back in comics. Legion of, Legion of superheroes is already back in comics. These were all things that were supposed to be happening in doomsday clock that don't even matter anymore. Mm. So I think that, That'll probably be the case. <laughs> um, if, if they do go back to it, it'll certainly be in the Doomsday Clock continuity and not in the show's continuity. And, I, and I'm okay with that because they're separate entities. Um, but I don't think it. I don't think it takes away from either one. Uh, you just got to know that you know one one's a potato and one's an apple. You know, like they're okay. they're, they're they're their own things. Okay. Yeah. But over, overall, and, and Murd, if you ever get the chance to sit down and watch this series, I'd love to get your thoughts on it because it is a, it is a deep and uh, investing series that just has so many layers of the of it, uh, of the onion that that uh, that un, untwine as you as you move forward. Hmm. So well, I would love to unravel that onion uh, for you or with you, Ian. And, uh, yes. <laughs> sounds like a uh, worthy footnoting project, actually. But uh, first, you know, it's 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 got to get to a platform that I can access. Understood, sir. Understood. Uh, th- there, I guarantee you there will be a DVD or Blu-ray set of this once it's all said and done. HBO is usually pretty good at that. Um, so we'll uh, we'll see about that. And as a worst comes to worst, if I need to lend you my HBO Go login so you can watch it on your computer, I will 100 percent do that, sir, because it's 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 damn good watching. Mm. All right then. Now, armed with your recommendation, I'll just uh, I'll just patiently uh, move back into my uh, guard emplacement and uh, stand watch for when it uh, comes my way. Hell yeah, hell yeah. Hey, ready, guys. I think I've shot my bolt. What about you guys? I uh, believe I have. Mm, magazine empty over here too. Excellent. I believe we are all full and ready for dessert. All right, pushing chairs back from the table. But first, here's a little after, the belt. after dinner mint for y'all. Yeah. If you'd like to send us an email, you can do so at comicgeekspeak at gmail.com. If you'd rather leave a voicemail, you can call the number 267-702-6642. You can like us on Facebook. You can follow us on Twitter, where our handle is at comicgeekspeak. You can leave us feedback at thecomicforums.vanillacommunity.com. You know, just uh, respond to some of the topics that we've addressed in this long, rambling feast of comic talk tonight. Um, and also uh, engage in discussions with your fellow CGS listeners on other topics maybe not directly related to the show. We'd like to give special thanks to all of you who have donated monetarily to the show in the past. We really appreciate it. Uh, the show would not be what it is today without your help. And as always, reuniting the world's mightiest heroes, one listener at a time. You got it on Wednesday, and it was like about it going to the volume up. These guys will talk about it, everything the geeks love. Okay, so let's 
Masterpiece of the 